Okay, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. This is the This Week in Tech, episode 55 on the Game Tech Reviews channel. So as always, we do the weekly show every Thursday evening at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific Time for those that are tuning in here that are new, those of you that are my regular Viewers, welcome to this episode. This is episode 55 now. Uh, I may have to change the name of this weekly show slash podcast thing because I was doing some search on YouTube and apparently there already is a This Week in Tech, like a This Week in Tech official uh, weekly show thing from another YouTube channel that has been around much longer. Uh, much, way more than 55 episodes, so I may have to rename the weekly show. It's not a big deal, I'll just have to change the name and then just the episodes will just carry on. Hey Nicholas, how's it going? As always, I'm trying to continue to grow the channel, so if you guys are new and you're tuning in for the first time, whether it's live or if you are watching this, as a recording after the live show and you like the sort of content and you like the other sort of content that's on the video or on the channel I should say feel free to subscribe it does help me try to grow this channel it does help me motivate myself to try to keep making more unique sort of content that is in the realm of PC DIY computer hardware whether we're talking uh, HEDT or gaming build or whatever it may be just standard PC desktop uh, we basically do it all, and we cover all of it on this channel. You're doing good? That's good. I'm doing good, too. This week was an interesting one. Not a lot of interesting tech news. What was really interesting was if you are in the U.S., there was that eclipse that passed through uh, on Monday. That that was kind of the highlight of the week for most people that were in North America. Uh, if you were in Canada, like the E, like... Uh, Around Montreal, I think they did get a decent amount of coverage. And then all through kind of the central part of the U.S. on the south end, all the way up through the east, the Midwest, uh, it was a pretty good total eclipse for a lot of different cities in the U.S. So you got to see the eclipse. That's cool. Yeah. Did, were you able to see the total eclipse or was it kind of a partial eclipse? Depending on where you were, I think... I want to say this one, this one had a lot of coverage. Like a lot of cities had 100% eclipse totality. Total in Canada, not in Montreal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because that, that eastern end there, like kind of like the Newfoundland area north of Maine, that was kind of the part of Canada that got to see the total eclipse. But yeah, I'm doing something interesting this stream. I am trying to test... Uh, a local recording of the stream as well as the upload to YouTube. So I am actually using both encoders. I'm using the AV1 encoder and the HEVC encoder because the GPU does have dual encoders. So I'm going to check the footage um, after the stream to see how the local recording did using the other encoder. So trying something different this time. Hey RK, good evening. Uh, there's not a whole lot to talk about on this stream in terms of new news. Like I said last week, tech news is going to be pretty dry, uh, for the most part in terms of product releases until the second half of the year. However, we are going to start seeing more and more hardware leaks specifically around AMD's Zen 5, because that is probably going to be the first of the, of a lot of new hardware launches that are slated to release later this year. So that being said, uh, uh, let's think. Well, I guess, I guess we can talk here a little bit more. While more viewers come in, Tech Power Up has photo of Zen Five. Yeah, I think I saw that. I think I saw that article. Yeah, this one. Is this really Zen Five though? What's the thing that designates that it's Zen Five? I don't know what makes it Zen 5, though. Oh, wait. The Zen 5... Right here. The alleged AMD engineering sample pictured below 
is an OPN 100 dash this 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 which is un which is unreleased. Okay. So yeah, I guess. I mean, okay. It'll be interesting to find out if they made any changes to the IHS. It's this number here, 100-000001290-0. Uh, I don't know if, if, if this, you wonder if this is fake, because it almost looks like whoever took the picture, it's possible that there was something here in the middle that they just kind of photoshopped out, they just blurred this, or blended it to get rid of it, so I don't know if this is real, I mean, it could be, the 2024 is kind of suspect uh usually sometimes these would say like 2023 if they're for the next calendar year so i don't know um i wouldn't be surprised if it is zen 5 because i'm just curious to know if they made any changes to the ihs like if they made the I ihs thinner and made the the io die and the ccd dies taller because I think that would reduce the typical operating temperature, or the target temperature, at least, if they did that. Um, yeah, because I just feel like Zen 4 surprised everybody with how hot it tries to run, even though it doesn't use that much power. So, um, that'll be interesting to see if they made any changes to that. But yeah, so this week we have... So a few articles here to talk about returning to DDR5. So DDR5 memory will soon hit over 9,000. I like how they put that in quotes, over 9,000. As Vcolor unveils 8,600 mega transfer overclocking spec under its, its Monta Xfinity series. Isn't Xfinity like a streaming service or something? I feel like this, this is some... This name has already been taken. <laughs> I, I can't help but think that. Just like how This Week in Tech, has, the name is already taken. I feel like Xfinity is something else. Um, I can't remember what it is. It's like some kind of... It, it, doesn't Comcast have some uh, like some kind of Xfinity cable service or so, something? I don't know. Maybe because it's cable, nobody cares. So Xfinity might be open to be rebranded as something else. But I don't know. Like... Uh, yeah. Hey, EGM. Here's... Yeah, this is RK's new RAM. Yeah, we're, we'll probably talk a little bit about RAM. Uh, you know, I feel like I've talked a lot about RAM on this channel. I feel like I'm the one tech tuber that talks about RAM. Like, there's not a lot of people that do RAM content outside of, like, random overclock content. Um, but, yeah, like... Depending on how Zen 5 has changes to the IMC and the fabric, the Infinity fabric especially, uh, because from my, from my perspective on the current AMD processors that have DDR5 memory controllers, they're not really the limiting factor. It's actually not the IMC that is the major limiting factor. It's more so the motherboard and the actual memory themselves. So, uh, it'll be interesting to see. I plan to try to get newer RAM later this year, but the thing is, it has to be high density and relatively high speed, and I want to try to run four sticks of memory with the newer CPU, because if you guys remember the video I did a few months ago, actually it was back in January, so yeah, it's been a few months now, about 192 gigabytes 192 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes i'm thinking of making another video on ram overclocking for four sticks of memory for a total of 128 i know i've done 192 but i have not done 128 and the process is the same but i think i want to show a different motherboard one that doesn't have a postcode debug because I know a lot of people that upgraded to DDR5 builds don't have motherboards that have the actual uh, the debug LED. 
So they might be curious to try something like high-speed memory, but they're afraid of whether or not it'll work, because, especially if you're doing four sticks, because four sticks of memory, especially high density, four sticks is okay, like four sticks is easy if you're running a total of 64 gigabytes. Like if you're doing 16 times four, that's not hard to do at all. Like you can easily run four sticks of 16 times four uh, on Ryzen and Intel at high speeds, no problem. It's the minute you go to dual rank DIMMs, like 32 gig DIMMs or 48 gig DIMMs, that is when you open up a can of worms and you have all kinds of problems trying to get that to run stable. So I'm probably going to do another video on RAM. I'm going to use probably an ASRock motherboard because there's not a lot of content. What I have noticed is that other than level one techs, I feel like ASRock is very underrepresented on the internet compared to the likes of ASUS and MSI. And I think Gigabyte, I would say, is like number three. Like if I had to rank in terms of how many videos you get bombarded with by tech tubers and review outlets talking about motherboards, obviously ASUS is the biggest one. You get bombarded with ASUS all the time. Number two is probably MSI, um, although you guys, it might be different. So let me know in the chat, like, do you guys think, do you think it's an accurate observation to say that ASUS is the most commonly seen on the internet? Second would be MSI, third is Gigabyte, and fourth is ASRock? Or do you feel that it's in a different order? I think everybody would agree that ASUS is the one that you see the most of. ASUS and MSI and Gigabyte. In that order, right? Like, I'm talking like first, most common, most commonly viewed, second, third, and fourth. Obviously, Biostar is number five. <laughs> In that order, Asus, MSI, and Gigabyte. And then I guess ASRock would be number four. Yeah, see, that's the same, that's kind of how I feel too. That's the general uh, consensus that I'm, I'm noticing. So I know I've covered Gigabyte a lot recently because I currently use a Gigabyte motherboard. And when I did my Threadripper build, I did that on a Gigabyte motherboard. And that worked fine as well. Although there were some things that were missing from that revision 1.0, which ma made me end up having to swap to Asus. The only other option was ASRock. And at the time, Asus was the only one that was readily available at my micro center. So I, and my return window for the Gigabyte board was coming up on almost over. So I had to make a move quick. So I ended up going to Asus. But yeah, uh, I do feel like ASRock is underrepresented in the tech media. So I think my next memory overclocking video is going to focus on ASRock. Or it's going to feature an ASRock motherboard. So probably the X670E Steel Legend. Um, cause that's the only one I've got. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if I had review samples and I, I, you know, ASRock can, I could use whatever ASRock wants to provide, but, uh, we'll just be doing a steel legend that does not have a postcode debug. Although despite it not having a postcode debug, the ASRock board is very good. Like if we, let's go here. And we're completely, like, not even following my little schedule. But we'll go back to the news articles. You haven't seen an ASRock motherboard review in a long time? Well, I mean, I did a build video. If you saw my build video that I did last year for X3D, when I built the uh, this PC, 7950X3D, this is with an ASRock board. So, um, yeah, I've got one. I've got a Steel Legend. So, and it's good. I mean, it's worked perfectly. Like, the uh, the Thunderbolt actually works. <laughs> like, Thunderbolt works on ASRock a lot better than it does on Gigabyte, surprisingly. So, well, not really surprisingly, because they're all supposed to work, but the fact that the ASRock one works better, like it's more compatible with things, is surprising. So, it's more that Gigabyte failed and messed up on their latest BIOS and basically broke compatibility with Thunderbolt completely 
Uh, I don't really know why, but um, you can't... Currently, if you want to use Thunderbolt, the Thunderbolt card on Gigabyte's latest, or I guess Gigabyte's current motherboards, like you can't use their own card. You have to downgrade your BIOS to a BIOS from like July of last year or November or October of last year or something. Like because they 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 basically screwed something up really bad. So uh, but Azrock, you know, it works. So yeah, I might I may be doing another RAM overclocking video, like a how how to do like 128 gigs of DDR5 at like 5200, 5600 or something on this motherboard. So, because I've gotten a lot of comments. You guys may not know, but I've gotten a lot of comments on RAM, like RAM-related topics, uh, probably because I'm the only one that talks about RAM out of the tech space. Like, no one talks about RAM. Like, when was the last time you saw videos about memory uh, on the larger YouTube channels? You know, you don't really hear about it. There's all this stuff about GPUs and stuff that everybody already regurgitates again and again and again. Uh, repeatedly, you know, like I don't really feel like talking about GPUs because there's really nothing to talk about until later this year. So I feel like the thing that I should talk about is RAM <laughs> because there's nothing else. <laughs> he always talks about RAM. Well, he's always talking about like specific RAM though. He's not talking in a general sense. But yeah, you're right. He does talk about RAM. Maybe GNN had a news part about colorful. Yeah, but that's just like one. That's just a news article, though. Like that's that's no different from me talking about this. You know, like oh, there's eighty six hundred megahertz RAM coming out soon. <laughs> it's like that's kind of this essentially what what people say. Oh, there's like new memory coming out, which is good because I am curious to know what happens with Zen Five. Because if Zen 5 has a higher clocked Infinity Fabric, that means that the ideal Gear 1 slash Gear 2 ratios will change. Like, the numbers will actually change. So, uh, that's why I'm curious to see. Because I've been thinking about getting high-speed memory, like 8000 DDR5, just to test to see. But I don't want to spend the money on like 8,000 megahertz RAM, if newer, better RAM is just around the corner and it will run at a lower voltage. Because I think the biggest thing, from my experience with DDR5, the largest roadblock is the memory requiring too high of a voltage because that requires active cooling on the RAM. Uh, for those that don't know, if you're running 1.43 volts, you should have fans over your memory sticks. You should not be just running your memory sticks at that kind of voltage with no active cooling. Like, no. And your front intake fan on your case is not enough to cool 1.34 volts DDR5. Just FYI. So if people are crashing and they're wondering, like, why is my game crashing if I overclock my RAM to... Well, it's because it's probably overheating. It's probably running over 60 degrees Celsius. Once RAM gets above 55 Celsius, you're going to have problems with stability, regardless of whether it's a stable overclock or not. It's a temperature problem is what it is. Um, but that's why I'm waiting for newer memory that runs at lower voltage. Like, for example, we need more kits that are like 8,000 megahertz at 1.35 volts. Currently today, there's only one kit of memory that I know of that does that. And it's like one G skill kit. It's a 48 gigabyte kit. So it's 2x24. And you guys have probably, those who watch my live streams regularly, you guys know exactly what RAM kit that I'm talking about. It's that one G skill Trident Z5 that runs at 8,000 and it can do it at 1.35 volts. And that is the only high speed RAM that I would ever consider buying because I know that at 1.35 volts, the RAM's not going to run that hot compared to 1.4 or 1.43. So um, you, you have more slack. You have more margin when you run your RAM at lower voltage or if it's spec to actually run at that high speed at that lower voltage. So that's the reason why um, 
I'm waiting for the maturity of DDR5, if you will. Now, it's definitely come a long way. It's come a long way. Um, you know, you used to have to have like 1.4 volts for 6,000. Now you can easily do 6,000 at 1.35. It, we're probably going to start seeing some of them that do 6,000 at 1.3. You know, 5,600 is 1.25 typically, which is actually a very good voltage. So I really hope someday we'll see like 6,000, 6,400 running at 1.25 volts because that'll basically open the door to Samsung to actually be viable again for memory. From what you've heard, most RAM sticks also have heavily bad heat spreaders. Some even perform better delitted. Yeah, the delitted ones though are only going to perform better if they if they have active cooling. Because yeah, sometimes those heat spreaders are so bad that even with a fan over them, it's like they're just basically trapping the heat inside the memory module. So yeah, that's kind of like when, you know when SSDs, I don't know if you guys remember this, but when SSDs, like M.2 SSDs were new, I remember when they first started trying to come out with heat sinks for the SSDs for on the motherboard, like it was a joke. Like they didn't actually work. Like they, they trapped the heat. I remember Gamers Nexus did a video about that. There was an MSI motherboard. Not to throw MSI under the bus, but I remember MSI had a motherboard. In fact, I have the motherboard. I can show you guys the motherboard. It's the X6. It's the one that has my 3800X in it. That one came with a heat sink for the M.2 drive, and that heat sink doesn't work. <laughs> it, it doesn't work. So, um, yeah, you don't use it. And that was meant for, like, a Gen 3 SSD, which those typically don't even need... Uh, heat sinks at all so you remember the nvme ssd covers that had no pads either yeah that, yeah i mean just to show you guys what i'm referring to um x370 x power gaming titanium so yeah this motherboard this is the motherboard and uh it this was the very first motherboard that had see look at that right there that little, that thing right there looks like an M.2 heat sink. That's not an M.2 heat sink. That's an M.2 cover. <laughs> That's a cover. That thing covers up the heat sink and just basically traps all the heat on it. So, yeah, this is my, my, fir my very first AM4 motherboard. This is my old X370. My 1800X was in this until I got the 3800X. But yeah, that is not a proper heatsink for M.2. Now motherboard M.2 heatsinks come a long... Yeah, they have come a long way. Like that, compare that to that. <laughs> like that thing up there in the middle. That thing is what? One, two, three, four. It's got four fins. Four fins, three stacked on top of the fourth one, which is the long one. Versus... This little slab of metal or aluminum or something that doesn't do anything. Like, that's that's not going to cool an SSD. <laughs> that's not going to cool. That cools an SSD. So, they've come a long way. For sure. Yes, they do. The one that I have has that. The, um, but the cool thing about the old motherboards, though, look at that. That thing has a postcode debug up there. I miss those. All right, so this is a motherboard that has really good M.2 cooling. So I wish they had, well, this is kind of angled, not really as angled as I would like. So, the Gen 5 heatsink is up here. And I'm actually using... So, this motherboard that you guys are looking at, this is the motherboard that I am streaming on right now. The Gigabyte Aorus Master X670E. 
And the SSD that is underneath this top super thick heatsink is, in fact, the the crucial T700 Gen 5 SSD. There's, I have a two terabyte Gen 5. This was the fastest SSD in the world. Currently, it is the second fastest SSD because Crucial has a newer T710, I believe is the model number. And that one actually does the full Gen 5 speed, 14,000 read and write. Whereas this one is 12,000 uh, four, well, you can't barely see it, but 12,400 on the reads and writes. So this is what is being cooled by the giant heatsink on the Aorus Master. And then underneath that, it is double-sided. So as Nicholas was saying, uh, I think there is a thing in here that shows that. I hope there is. Let me see. Is there? So... Yeah, see, underneath this heatsink, on the side that's on the bottom of the SSD, there is a pad to the motherboard. And it's the same for the other three M.2 drives that go underneath this secondary plate here. So, I wish they had a picture of that. I thought they did. Hold on, is there one here? No... That's kind of a missed opportunity, Gigabyte. I thought you guys had something. Thermal Guard 3. What is this? Thermal Design, Fins, and Array. No. This is not good. This is not useful. They should have they should have done their website. Like, I could have sworn they had like a thing that actually showed the underside pad. They had like a little video. No, see, that's fail. That's not even... They're not even showing the pad. There's a pad there. This isn't even the same board. Anyway. They've got pads on both the top and the bottom for this board, though. For the SSD. So... Gigabyte has mostly been very good. Overall, I would say Gigabyte is fine for motherboards. Um, I will tell you guys, I for my next motherboard, I am strongly considering ASRock or MSI. So basically, the other vendors. In this case, MSI is the one that I have not used this whole generation. Um, they were what I used years ago. Um, but I, I will definitely consider MSI because the thing is, and you guys may not know this, but when I wanted to upgrade to Zen 4 almost two years ago at this point, because 2022 is when Zen 4 came out, my initial plan was to get the MSI X670E Meg Ace. That was the motherboard that I wanted to get for my Zen 4 build. And I never managed to get it because it was... It was not available on launch day. You couldn't get one from Newegg. Micro Center didn't have them. You know, and, and you you actually couldn't get one that first two weeks or so unless you were one of the lucky ones that managed to get one like on launch day. You weren't able to get it. Yeah, RK got. Yeah, RK got the one that I wanted to get. Like RK beat me to it on I guess launch day, because I was there on launch day for the fifth. Right here, guys, 7950X. So when I went to go get 7950X and DDR5 on launch day, I was expecting to pair this thing up with an MSI Meg Ace. RK beat me to it, bought out the Ace. I couldn't get one, and yeah, I ended up getting the Aorus Master instead, and that's how I ended up on Gigabyte. <laughs> I never planned to go to Gigabyte. Not saying Gigabyte's bad. Gigabyte has been pretty solid. I am going to say Gigabyte, I have not really used Gigabyte that much, but Gigabyte has been pretty solid. The one area where Gigabyte has kind of screwed up recently, and this is only recently, is with Thunderbolt support. They did a BIOS update, or they came up with a new BIOS around January that broke compatibility with their Thunderbolt card. You, you can't do Thunderbolt anymore unless you downgrade to an older BIOS. Now, they'll 
probably fix this. I hope they fix that. So, you know, that's the kind of thing, though, that would get me to consider another vendor because that sort of ruins workflows in that scenario or, you just, or you're stuck on the older BIOS. So, you know, there's stuff like that. Uh, but overall, in terms of build quality, the hardware itself... Gigabyte's motherboards are pretty solid. In fact, Gigabyte has some of the best value for money motherboards. Like, uh, you guys want to know what's a good value for money motherboard? I'll show you. This one. This motherboard from Gigabyte is probably one of the best value for money motherboards. The Gigabyte X670 Oris Elite AX. This motherboard is probably the best value for money motherboard if you're someone who wanted to upgrade to a DDR5 platform. Um, the only thing it doesn't have is Gen 5 on the X16 primary graphics card slot. It does give you Gen 5 for the M.2 drive, but other than that, everything is going to be Gen 4 so or Gen 3. But other than that, this motherboard is pretty solid. Like, this is one that I would recommend easily to a lot of people. It's not that much money, especially now because the prices of motherboards have gone down because we are on the cusp of waiting for a new refresh cycle. So, but yeah, this this one is pretty good. The the B, Asus B550E for $100. Yeah, the, well, yeah, that's but that's B550. So, like, if you need if you need the connectivity, like, if you need the extra lanes that X670 offers, I feel like this one is really good value. The other one that is really, really good value is the Steel Legend from ASRock. Like, this one is, it's a little bit more expensive. In some cases, it's actually the same price or a little bit cheaper than the, uh, the Oris Elite. But this one is the full... 24 lanes of Gen 5 for under $300. Under $300 for 24 lanes of Gen 5 is a pretty good deal considering how many retimers they have on these motherboards. ASRock tend to have mail-in rebates around. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I feel like ASRock is underrated. Like, ASRock is definitely the one that is underappreciated. Like, okay, look at this, guys. Look at this. This motherboard, not only does it come with the board and the Wi-Fi antenna, it comes with a anti-sag bracket for your graphics card. In fact, this anti-sag bracket is better than most anti-sag brackets because this one, you basically screw it in uh, like here and here on the side. Like right over here is where the bracket would sit. So it doesn't get in the way of your cable management and it doesn't get in the way of like anything that's in front. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it just straight up includes it. It includes an anti-sag GPU bracket. And that, that's, that's so convenient for those who have an older case that does not include an anti-sag bracket or you're working in a weird case like the Fractal Torrent doesn't have... Uh, a place to put one of those regular, like a, a thing of Lego bricks, because it's got fans, it's got intake fans on the floor of the case. So stuff like that, although the Fractal Torrent does include a anti-sag bracket that's kind of like this. So, but it's nice to have. You see what I'm saying? Like, and this motherboard is typically like $279, so it's sub $300. It's the full PCI Gen 5 experience. It's the more premium AMD chipset. You know, it's the X670 chipset, not the B651. And then it includes all this stuff. The only thing that this motherboard doesn't have is that coveted postcode debug LED to tell you that your memory is training. Code 15. You don't get your code 15 uh, when your memory training. You got your little LEDs, which I can't stand because that doesn't really tell you a lot if you're troubleshooting a problem. Um, but that's the one thing that it doesn't have. The postcode debug. That oh-so-coveted postcode debug that you have to spend like $400 or more to get nowadays. 
maybe lightning and one other is cheaper. Yeah, the lightning, actually, you know what? That one includes it too. The I know which one you're talking about. You're talking about the X670 PG lightning. Yeah, this one. I think this one includes it also, doesn't it? I thought it did. Maybe it doesn't include it. Maybe I was wrong. Yeah, I thought I thought there was a lower there was a more budget friendly Azrock board that included the I think it does include the the anti sag GPU brace. I think it does. That's really good value. Yeah, this is a really good value motherboard too. Like this one's even cheaper than the Steel Legend. So, I think this one has less PCI Gen 4, though. I think they have even less retimers on this one. But, yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, like, in terms of value, I feel like ASRock is definitely the one that is not really talked about. And, I honestly, I think it's all about marketing. It's really all about marketing. Because I've been using the Steel Legend. So, for those that don't know... The Steel Legend currently is what I use with the 7950X3D and the RTX 4090. The 4090 and the 7950X3D, which is arguably my most powerful gaming PC, that one is using the Steel Legend. So it's, it isn't even using my most expensive motherboard. My most expensive motherboard is the Aorus Master. This is, like, this is a $500 motherboard. This is the one that I'm using right now for the streaming PC. This one has my launch 7950X um, in it, but it's literally been in there since day one. So, but I plan to swap the CPU later this year to Zen 5. So most likely the Aorus Master is what I will continue to use for the Zen 5 CPU, unless there's some massive improvement to the new chipset in terms of like memory training speeds and all this other stuff and USB 4 native and all that kind of stuff, then I might actually swap to a newer motherboard. But I'm not really planning to do that, at least as of right now. Hey Sid, what's going on? It's been a while. ASRock Pro RS seems the middle, at least going by price. Yeah, maybe it's the Pro. Maybe it's the Pro that has Pro RS. Maybe this... Oh, this is the one. Yeah, see? Look, this one includes the anti-sag bracket. This includes an uh, anti-sag bracket. Yeah, okay, so it's not the PG Lightning. I think it's the Pro. The Pro RS and the Steel Legend include an anti-sag bracket. And you guys know what? Newsflash... The reason why the 4090 is with the Steel Legend is because the 4090 is using the anti-sag bracket. Just FYI. I am using the anti-sag bracket to support the RTX 4090. And all of its weight. So, 4090 is being supported by the Steel Legend's anti-sag bracket. That's one of the reasons why that's in that, uh, paired up with that motherboard. Because uh, I don't have to worry about GPU sag. Personally, not using any sag bracket for 4080. Is it a, what type of 4080 is it though? Because for 4080, you don't really need one unless it's like a super heavy one. Founders, yeah, the Founders is okay. I'm using the Founders also. The Founders is probably fine. Without a sag bracket because it's a it's a triple finger. It's got three fingers. The ones that are gonna be prone to sag are the two fingers. If your GPU only has two fingers, you better you and it's a big GPU like a 4090 or an XTX or some really fat GPU, and it's only two fingers, you better be using an anti-sag bracket. Just just public service announcement. If you have a two-finger GPU and it's a high-end GPU. You better be using a sag bracket. Supreme X has three metal fingers. Yeah. Nitro has three fingers. Yeah. Nitro has three fingers, but it's I would still use one. I would still... 
even though those GPU, that's just me. You guys, you guys don't have to though. But I'm just saying, like, if you've got two fingers, you should use a sag, an anti-sag bracket. If you have three fingers, it's optional. I personally, if I have one, like in this case, my Steel Legend has one. I am going to use it, um, just because. Like, I, I don't think that's an OCD problem. That's just, if I have this thing, why not use it rather than like leave it in some bag somewhere just to get lost. You know what I'm saying? You might as well just use it so it doesn't get lost. So, um, that's that's kind of my take on GPU sag brackets. Like, they're not really necessary, but if I have them, if, if, I, if it came with the motherboard, I'm going to use it, right? Like, why not? Why not use it? Uh, the only annoying thing is if you swap out your GPU and if you put in one that's a different height, then you have to go and adjust this thing. But it's not that, it's not, it's just like, it's like an extra screw. It's like one or two extra screws. So it's not a big deal. Yeah, the Sapphire, so in the case of my Nitro, I use, I use something called the Fractal Torrent Case. For those that don't know, This thing. Is this it? This one? Yeah, this one. So this is the case. This case includes its own anti-sag bracket. And I use that for the Sapphire Nitro XTX. So the, the, the Sapphire Nitro XTX goes in this case with the Aorus Master and the 750X. Even though it's three fingers, I still use the sag bracket because the sag bracket comes with the case. So, but I don't have a sag, I don't have a, uh, not all of my cases have anti-sag brackets. Like for example, uh, the Steel Legend, the case that the Steel Legend's installed in, that case is very old. It's from 2013. It's like 11 years old. And it, it do obviously it doesn't have an anti-sag bracket. So I use the one that came with the motherboard. So 4090 gets this. Sapphire Nitro gets the one that comes with this case. So they both end up doing the same thing. And they both they're both nice because they don't get in the way. Like this I don't use the sag brackets that like you have to stick somewhere in front or the ones that go like along the GPU Br brace. I don't like those. Like for example, uh, speaking of Sapphire, the Sapphire Nitro includes a, uh, an, an anti-sag bracket. Yeah, see, so this, where's the picture of it? It doesn't show it. Um, well, it comes with one. I don't know why. Here it is. See, that thing. It comes with this L bracket, or this L brace. I don't like these. I don't use these. Because... If I use this... Because this GPU... This GPU is already four slots. Think about that. You have the three fingers, then you have the fourth slot that the cooler and its fans impede into. So this is technically a four slot GPU. This is a very, very thick GPU. So if you add this, this bracket essentially turns this GPU into a five slot GPU. Now, if I do that, I can't use my X4 slot in my motherboard because the fifth slot is typically where your X4 slot is, or maybe it's where the X1 or the X2 slot is. The point is you can't use your other PCIe slots if you install this bracket. Maybe the very, very bottom slot, but that one typically is not usable because it's like an x1 usually although in the case of the steel legend this is why the steel legend is such a good motherboard the x4 slot is at the very bottom so you can still plug a capture card or a thunderbolt card 
in the bottom slot of the motherboard. This is exactly what I have done. Um, but the point is, like, I wouldn't use this. I would have to use one like this one because it doesn't get in the way of me being able to use my other PCIe slots. So, so it's nice that they include one with the GPU, but it's not a realistic... It's not, it's not a, a practical anti-sag bracket. The one with the steel legend is, like, way better. So, and, and the one that comes with the Fractal Torrent, or the ones that come with cases, are generally a lot better. What about the NV7 GPU support bracket? The NV7, I don't know what that is. The NV7 case? Oh, Fantex? Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, that one, I see it. Yeah, that one I could use. That one's kind of like the one in the Fractal Torrent. So, yeah, my Fractal Torrent's anti-sag bracket is very similar to this one. So, yeah, I would use this one. I, I'm just saying I don't like the ones that you have to use up this side, this area, to have this long bar that runs across here. Like, that. that's a no-go. That's not going to work. Because that's, that's going to block a PCIe slot, and... It depends on the user, like if, if you guys are just, like if someone's just building a gaming PC and they're never going to use their, the full potential of their motherboard, then, you know, whatever. That then doesn't really matter. But the, someone like me, like a power user, someone who actually needs all the resources that their computer can offer them, yeah, no, I'm not going to block my PCIe slots for that. Your XTX blocks a support bracket, can't use it. The XTX blocks a support bracket? No, normally you'd put it lower. You you have the ability to lower it. It's it's adjustable. It's too long. Are you talking about the one that goes in front of it? Or are you talking about... A, you might be talking about a different type, like an OEM type. Normally you can adjust it, unless you're saying that the GPU is so thick that you can't lower the support bracket low enough to be able to get underneath the graphics card. Maybe that's what you mean. Yeah, I know. I, I have the Sapphire Nitro Plus, and I'm using the support bracket that comes with the Fractal Torrent with, the, with this case, and it works fine. I think I even have a video showcasing it, like how to install it. In fact, I'm pretty sure my unboxing video... For the Sap Sapphire Nitro actually shows how to install it with this support bracket. For this case though, but yeah, if you have a different case, I don't know. But yeah. Wow, we've we've talked almost 50 minutes about GPU sag, anti-sag brackets, and I guess DDR5. <laughs> wow. Very efficient uh, stream here, talking about like anti-sag brackets of all things. I'm gonna have to make an anti-sag bracket discussion portion of this video now. So, but anyway, going back to what we were talking about with the motherboards, like I forgot where this came up. Oh, we we're talking about the uh, SSD heat sinks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, heat sinks and anti-sag brackets. Motherboards that include them are relatively good above average motherboards. That's that's the conclusion. And if you have an anti-sag bracket and you have a heavy GPU, there's no reason not to use the bracket. So go ahead and use the bracket unless you just can't fit it for whatever reason or uh, you need the PCIe slots and it's one of those brackets like the Sapphire one that blocks the PCIe slot. Uh, Met mentioned earlier the Asus B550E. Yeah, the B550 in general, those are good. Like, there's a lot of B550. Like, if you guys want to save money on the motherboard, B650 is very good. In fact, that's one of the things that makes AMD builds easier to figure out. What I mean by that is 
because there's B650 and there's X670 and there's really good options on both sides, like you have an easy way to determine like your price point for the motherboard in terms of what you can expect the motherboard to do and, and not do. Whereas I think if you're building an Intel setup, Z790 is really the only choice unless you want to buy like an old Z690 motherboard, uh, but I would not recommend doing that at this point in time. The uh, unless you want connectivity, if you don't care about like the newer chipset, if you don't care about high speed DDR5, get Z690 because you're actually getting a better deal when it comes to uh, PCIe lane allocation. Like just no joke, it's better. Like Z790, the primary M.2 slot, for example, the one up here, it steals lanes from the graphics card. On every single Z790 motherboard, there is no denying it. There is no way around it, except don't use your primary M.2 slot. So, uh, that being said, Z690 is actually superior because of that downside of Z790. And the other problem with Z790 is because Intel's budget chipset is so trash compared to Z790, like, nobody even considers the Intel B760, I think, is what it is. Like, nobody would buy an Intel B760 motherboard. It's garbage. You can't overclock. You can't change anything. Like, it's very locked down. Uh, I don't even think they have unlimited power mode. So, you basically would be gimping your fancy i9 if you put it in a B760 motherboard. So, that's the reason why... Those don't exist. Those are basically dead to me. So that leaves Z790. The problem with Z790 is that the variance in quality is way across the board. You've got cheap Z790. You have expensive Z790, which is like X670E equivalents. And then you've got everything in between. So um, that's the reason why... I mean, I get comments on some of my videos for memory overclocking asking me like how to do stuff on Z790. Well... Problem is, it's usually somebody went and bought like a really cheap Z790, which I don't even think it's like an, it might be an eight layer PCB. I have no idea. Um, but you know, like that's like a huge gamble of whether or not you're going to be able to do 8,000 megahertz DDR5 on that board because the IMC may be able to do it, but could be the motherboard can't do it. You know what I'm saying? So, um, at least with, the AM5 motherboards, you have a clear distinction. You have B650, and that has very, very good value. Then you have, you even have like the flagship B650E. You know, you have B650E, which is actually really good. Some of those even have the postcode debugs. Those are like the $350 B650E, though. And then there's the X670 and X670E. And if you're buying X670E, you're pretty much not limited in any way in terms of connectivity. So, it's easier for me to scope out a build uh, if I'm able to to segment the build based off of certain criteria. And it's much harder to do that with Intel. It's not impossible by any means. It's just harder to do. So And, and stuff like if someone requests, like I get a request often, like how do you do... How do you do like 128 gigs of RAM at like 6,000 or, or better? You're like, I keep getting asked that. That's the one reason why I made that video earlier this year. But people keep asking me how to do that on like a Z790 motherboard. The answer is you can't do it. I hate to break it to you guys, but you can't do it because those tweaks that you guys see me do in that video, those only work on AMD motherboards because AMD motherboards let you change resistor values. The Intel motherboards don't let you do that. So you're basically at the mercy of the IPC and the motherboard itself just being fixed with fixed values and you can't change them. So um, I don't know if 14th gen can do 6,000, 128 gigs or more. Um, I tried to do 5,600 last year on my 13900K. Like I literally tried to do... The same thing I did with my AMD motherboard, 
uh, on Intel with an Aorus Z790, Aorus Master, I couldn't get it to work. It, in fact, it crashed my operating system. Like, I had to reinstall Windows. It was so bad. Um, and that was at 5600. That was not even 6000. That was 5600. So I had to test. I basically gave up and just did 4800 at the end of the day. Uh, but I don't know. Like, mm, I was thinking maybe if I upgrade to 14900K, I could retest that. But I don't think it's worth it. Like, I, I would not look at 14th gen at this point because Zen 5 is only a few months away and Arrow Lake is also coming out. So at this point, like, Z790 is kind of a dead socket. So if, unless you're already on the platform, just like those who are already on AM4, you know, like 14th gen need not apply. Honestly, no clue why people even need that much RAM. You can only think of people wanting to run new giant LLM module. Well, see, what I what I often hear... Th now, this is going to sound really dumb or hilarious, but the reason why people keep asking me how to do four sticks of memory high speed, and it's often like 128 gigs, is because they say it looks nicer. That's literally the reason. They say four sticks of memory in the build is nicer to look at than two sticks of memory. That's the reason why they want to run four sticks. It sounds so superficial and lame because to hear that that is the reason why they want four sticks of memory. So my answer to them is run 64 gigs. Run 4x16. That will do 6,000 on Intel. It will also do that on AMD. Like 100% guaranteed, you can do 64 gigs, 4x16 on AMD and Intel at 6,000, no problem, 24-7. I have tested it on both, so I know it works. So, but slot dummy sticks then? But th those don't light up. Those are like, they don't light up, right? <laughs> they, they want, okay, see, look, here's what people want. People want four RGB sticks because it looks better. Even though they don't even need that much RAM. So that's why I tell them my answer at the end of the day, if they're not willing to accept that they can't do 6,000 on 128 gigs, I tell them, do you need that much RAM? The answer is no. If the answer is no, 64 gigs is the answer. Go and get 4X16 and that's all you need. That's the answer. So, because I'm, like, it's hilarious, like, hearing these, the, or just even reading comments and then people keep messaging me, like, hey, uh, I saw that video that you did about 6,000 or 192, like, can you help me tune my system to get 128 working? And I'm like, first of all, first of all, number one is if it, it is it AMD? That's the question. That's the first question. I ask. Is it AMD? Because if it's not, forget it. Go to 64 gigs and you're done. Um, because you can't change. You basically, you guys would be surprised at how many people message me how to do what I did in my video, even though the video is literally there for them to follow. But they want to do it on Z790, and and the reason why they message me is because you can't do those things on Z790. So, so it's, it's in my mind, it's like a flow chart. It's like, let's go to paint. The question I get is, can or how? How? How do I run? How do I run four sticks, 128 gigabytes in parentheses, because that's typically how much RAM they're talking about, uh, DDR5 at 6,000? Or, or it, you know what, guys? Some, somebody, you know what someone asked me one time? Someone asked me, how do you do 8,000 megahertz? Can you help me do 128 gigs at 8,000? First of all, there are no 32 gigabytes. There's no... There's no 64 gig that runs at that speed. So first of all, that that's not right. But like I've had people ask me how to do this. Like how do I run four sticks, 128 gig total, DDR5 at 7200? 
Like, because I made that RAM video, I get this question all the time. All the time. And so every time I see this number, I'm like, okay, well, the fact that someone went and bought 7200, I'm assuming that means they're on something like this. Because if you're on something like this and you bought 7200 megahertz RAM, I'm sorry, but you wasted your money. <laughs> no joke, you literally just wasted money. You just threw money in the trash for buying 7200 because it's not it's not necessary. Like it doesn't help. It doesn't do anything. Like it, it's actually worse than 6000. Especially when you go to four sticks. So, but like I get this question all the time. Like, how do I do 128 gigs of 7200? Well, the answer is no, you don't. Like, that's the answer is no, you don't. Why not put disclaimer on the video? Well, it literally says on a AM5 in uh, in the title of the video. So, and and if you read the description of the video, the description literally says X670E, all the specs, everything's there. So, I don't know, man. It's like, people will still wonder about these things. So, the answer is, no, you don't, but for this. But, like, okay, I get this question. I get this question a lot, too. Because I actually show how to run it at 6,000. Like, I actually show this. In fact, I, I go beyond this. I do this. I do 192. But it's basically the same. It's basically dual rank. So, it's a flowchart. So, the, the thing is, there's a decision tree. We have to do a decision. Uh, what's the... Uh, does paint have that shape? It's supposed to be like a parallelogram. Right? It's supposed to be like a... Wow, I can't... I can't turn this into a parallelogram. Anyway... It's a flowchart. So, the, th the first question is, is it AMD? And then, so it's like, it goes like this. Um, if, if it is, we continue on. If it isn't, we're done. If no, no, you don't run 6000 4x32 or 4x48 on Intel. You just don't do that. That's not how it works. You can't do it. Uh, if yes, so that, that basically ends it right there. That's the end. Uh, trust me, I've tried, and I suffered the consequences of corrupting my OS, so I know it doesn't work, uh, on Intel. If yes, then follow the video. Adjust the, or it's like, what is it, load, load XMP Expo, um, manually set 6,000... Um, you might want to also try setting gear two manually, possibly, and then, and then uh, adjust the impedance values. You got to adjust the impedance values. I I get so many comments of people saying I loaded XMP and manually set it to six thousand, but it's still not working. And I up the voltage to one point four five volts. The voltage at one point four five volts doesn't do anything. You can put 1.5, it won't do anything. You can lower it to 1.35, it won't do anything. That's not what does anything. This is the secret sauce. But apparently nobody really watched... The people who asked the question, I don't know. Like, did they watch the video? Because, like, assuming they're on AMD, they're eligible to try it. And I've gotten people that have asked me this, and they're on AMD, and it's like, I don't understand, like, how hard it can be, man. But anyway, that's kind of my little rant on how to do four sticks, 128 gig or more at 6,000. It can be done. It's not easy. In fact, adjusting impedance values depends heavily on the memory kit 
and the motherboard. In fact, when it comes to overclocking memory on AMD, it's all about the memory and the motherboard. It is less about the actual CPU and more about the memory and the motherboard. Whereas with Intel, it's only about the IMC of the actual Intel CPU. So like, because you can't change anything on the motherboard, you can only rely on the IMC. So all the, all the, the efforts to run high speed on Intel, it's all on the CPU. You can't do anything with the motherboard because adjusting this, this is changing the actual resistive values for the memory circuitry itself. This depends on the motherboard and the RAM. It has nothing to do with the CPU. Or very, very little to do, I should say, with the CPU. Yes, the CPU, the integrated memory controller quality does matter, but the extent at which it matters is far less important than the actual ability for the RAM to handle these lower or higher impedance values. And that is the secret sauce of how to run a lot of memory at relatively high speed considering i mean 6000 is considered a high speed for four sticks those that think that 6000 is not considered a high speed you need to go back and read the official specs i probably should preface this because i can see it now someone's going to watch this part of the live stream or i'm going to turn this into a clip and they're going to catch this one part and they're going to be like you know why is it not working well official speed for am5 or i guess we'll say zen 4 because Zen 5 might be different, is uh, 5200 megahertz for one DPC and 3600 megahertz for two DPC. I, I have to emphasize this, the second one especially, because so many people think that the motherboard and the and the RAM guys and AMD and Intel are are false advertising because they'll see a reviewer show like a bunch of benchmarks with DDR5 6000 or whatever uh, and they're like hey why isn't mine working you know but the thing is the reviewer was testing 32 gigabytes of RAM and Whoever's watching the videos, like, they're trying to test the same thing, but they're running, like, 128 gigs of RAM. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's not apples to apples. That's not how it works. Like, the reviewer is being judged at this value. So 6,000, that's 800 megahertz above 5,200. So that is an, that's considered an overclock. But it is, it is a achievable overclock. Whereas someone running 128 gigs of memory, they will be judged to this value. Meaning this, 3600 is their starting point. They start from there. So if I'm helping, if I'm troubleshooting someone's, why their PC's not booting, whatever, and it's usually always memory related, uh, this is the first thing I look at. Like how much RAM are you running? How many sticks of memory are you running? And if it's four sticks, and if it's 128 or 192, well, you're starting at 3600, not 4800, not 5200, definitely not 6000, because the system might not even boot at 6000 without manual tweaks. So, um, that's these are the reference points. These are the reference points. Oh, and maybe we sh while we're at it, we should probably list Intel's reference specs, because... People always seem to say, oh, Intel runs faster DDR5 than AMD. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't. Speeds for, we'll say, 12, 13, well, no, not 12, 13, 14, Gen. So, okay, pop quiz time for my viewers. For those that watch my content you guys probably know the answers, but let's see. Let's see how many people watching live know the equivalent spec for Intel's 
13th and 14th gen processors. So the question is, what is the official Intel speed for one DPC, one uh, R or two R, meaning single rank or dual rank, and what is the official speed for two DPC, dual rank. We'll do dual rank because that's exactly what this is up here. Well, this could be one or two, but whatever, you guys get the idea. So let, let's see if, here, let's, um, how do I do the, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna make it multiple choice. I'm not gonna give out the, the actual answer because that'll make it too easy. People can blind guess and get it right. So let's see if you guys know what the official speed, uh, people are probably trying to Google it. That's fine, whatever. It's, uh, it's not that easy to find compared to AMD. AMD's is actually much easier to find. 52 comes to mind for the first one. You don't know the second one? So this is the interesting thing because this is where uh, I think the narrative, like this is where people get confused. This is, where, this is where it gets interesting. So here I'm just going to... Whoops. I didn't want to do that. Oh, you know what I should have done? I should have made this like its own line. Because now I'll have to erase this. Uh, where's the eraser? Well, you know what I can do? I can like box this or delete this section. So, okay, so it looks like Nicholas answered. No one else dares to answer. They're probably afraid of being wrong lot while we're live. They don't like being put on the spot. That's fair enough. So, the correct, here's the answer, guys. I'm just going to go ahead and give you the answer. So, the answer for the first one is 50, whoops, 32, 32. That's DDR4. The answer is 5,600 megahertz for one DPC. 5,600 megahertz is for two sticks of memory that are either single or dual rank. That's single or dual rank. This is the reason why Intel tends to clock higher when you're running two sticks of memory. And that's the reason why almost all the overclocking DDR5 content that you guys see on channels like Buildzoid, he largely only focuses on this specific use case. If you guys, are, if you guys follow Buildzoid, because we were talking earlier at the start of the stream, um, you know, like not enough YouTubers cover RAM. Well, I mean, besides myself, Buildzoid does a lot of RAM videos, but he's focused, he focuses on a specific piece of it, like a small subset. And his subset is heavily focused on the first condition for Intel, and he also has videos on AMD, but because AMD, because of the way the fabric works, and we've talked about this in a previous video, on a previous live stream, there isn't really much benefit to doing anything outside of either 6,000 or 8,000 on AMD. Like that's why 6,000 and 8,000 are the two magic numbers. You choose whether you want low latency or high throughput. That's the trade-off. You pick one of those and those are your speeds for AMD's DDR5. So that's why there's not that much content on Zen 4 when it comes to memory. But Intel, because Intel officially is 5,600, that means your base, your official baseline speed is starting off at 5600, which means anything above 5600 is considered an overclock. So, henceforth, why Bill Zoy's channel actually hardcore overclocking? He is literally all about overclocking. So, that's what you're not going to see him do a video about how to run 5600 on a 14900K because that's how it can run out of the box with two sticks of memory. Now, 
Here's the more interesting thing. What about four sticks of memory? Four sticks of memory is where it gets really interesting. So the official speed, the official speed for Intel, four sticks, DDR5, dual rank, is 3600 megahertz for two DPC, dual rank. It is exactly the same as AMD in terms of the official rated speed. So, so right here, that is the answer. This is the answer why you can't do 6,000 on 128 gigs on an Intel system. Because think of how, think of how much of a massive overclock 6,000 is versus 3,600. DDR5. And we're, remember, I said 3600. 3600 DDR5, not 3600 DDR4. 3600 DDR4 is basically 6000 DDR5. So that shows you guys how much faster 3600 DDR4 is versus DDR5 in terms of latency at least. So 3600 is exactly identical to Zen 4, which means you can expect both of them to behave about the same when you run four sticks of memory. And for the most part, they do. But the, the reason why AMD is actually better when you want to run four sticks of memory at higher speeds is because of this thing down here. That is the secret reason why, and nobody talks about this. I think I'm the only YouTuber that has ever talked about this. So if when it comes to four sticks, high density, meaning dual rank, DDR5, AMD is actually more reliable if you're trying to overclock beyond the official 3600, because both of them have 3600 as the official number. So you know what that means? That means if you are trying to run your RAM at, say, 5200 or even 4800 or 5000, and you're running like 128 gigs and it's not working, and you try to open up a support ticket with G-Skill or Corsair or Asus, you know, whoever your motherboard manufacturer is or your memory manufacturer is or even like Intel or AMD, like... The first thing I'm going to ask you is, what's the memory running at? And if you tell them, if you tell them that you're running 128 gigs at like, or you're trying to get it to run at 4800, they're going to close the case on you. They're just going to say that's unsupported config and move on. That's what they're going to do. They're going to tell you, your official spec, they're going to give you this number. They're going to give you that number. If you're talking to Intel, they're going to give you this number. If you're talking to your motherboard manufacturer, they're going to give you this number. And if you're talking to, okay, here's where it gets really interesting. When you start talking to the memory guys, like G-Skill, Corsair, V-Color, um, all those different guys that make memory, like, or sell memory, or if you're talking directly to Micron, well, Micron doesn't really, you know, whatever. But like Hynix, um, they're, they're, at first they're going to try to help you, but if they sense that this is a lost cause, it's an unsupported config. They're just gonna say it's an unsupported config, and they're gonna try to they're gonna try to give you an excuse like, oh, it's not on the QVL list. Even if it's on the QVL list, they're gonna be like, well, it's on QVL list, but only for two sticks. You know, like that's what they're gonna say. So, just fair warning for anybody that's trying to overclock their DDR5 and they're running a lot of memory, and it's not working out. Uh, and they're on AMD. They at least have a path. If they're on Intel, they are up the creek without a paddle. So, yeah, these are the official specs. Um, so, that pretty much covers that. Here, let's... 
let's change the topic now. So Intel, let's talk about Intel. Intel's LGA 1851 socket is pictured, ready to debut with Meteor Lake Meteor Lake PS. I don't know what PS is. And also Aero Lake Core Ultra 200 ready. What's Core Ultra 100? Is Core Ultra 100 the Meteor Lake? Did I miss the memo on Meteor Lake? So, Intel's next-gen socket has finally surfaced and will support both Meteor Lake PS and Air Lake S Core Ultra 200 CPUs. All right, so it shows high resemblance to the predecessor with changes made to the mounting mechanism. So does that mean we're going to have to buy new coolers or new brackets for this thing? LGA 1851. So that means that this, so the current socket is LGA 1700 and for those that don't know the number means the number of pins on the CPU just to use this as an example if we look at I'm just gonna bust out a random CPU here that's inside this box what is this this is a CPU so just to show you guys here I have with me a Zen CPU. I don't want to drop this. So this is an old AMD CPU. This is a Ryzen 2700X. This has pins on it. Those pins. Does anybody know how many pins are on this Zen, this AM4 CPU? This is called PGA, Pin Grid Array, or it's technically UPGA, Micro Pin Grid Array. So, the number of pins is, I believe, 1331, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody can Google it and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just going to randomly throw the number out. 1331. AMD's AM4 CPUs have 1,000, 1,331 pins on an AM4 CPU. Now, AM5 has 1,718 pins. That's 1718. So was I right? 1331? I think I was right. 1331. So yeah, I got it right. So there are literally... 1,331 pins on this 2700X. I almost forgot that I had this CPU. So apparently I do have a Zen Plus. Now I know, I got, I got Zen Plus. Zen Plus, right there. The, I, the Ryzen 7 2700X. That has 1,331 pins. That is AM4. AM5 has 1,718. So the way I remember that, the easiest way to remember how many pins AM5 CPUs have, if you're someone who watched Dragon Ball Z, you'll get this reference. Android 17 and 18. Android 17 and 18. Meaning AM5 has... 1718 pins 1718 pins that is an am5 cpu so intel 13th gen and 14 and 12th gen all three of them have 1700 pins that means am5 has 18 more pins than the current intel cpus However, now that brings us to Arrow Lake. Arrow Lake will have 1,851 physical pins. So they're increasing the pin count by 151 pins. So not that much of an increase compared to the existing LGA 1700. And it's not like it always goes up. The number doesn't always go up. Sometimes the number goes down. Uh, now, here, where's paint again? Uh, let's... Do I need to keep this? I guess not. 
Well, you know what? I want to keep I want to keep the official speeds. Let's delete the flow chart because I think we're done with this part. So, just to put up some sockets here. Socket AM4 was PGA 1331. That means it has 13, 1,331 pins. Socket AM5 is LGA 1718. Like I said, Android 17 and Android 18. That is the way I memorize how many pins are on an AM5 socket. I know that's a really weird, it like, sounds so out of left field, um, but that's how I'll never forget the number. Okay. Now let's put some other ones. So Intel, well, let, let's put some Intel sockets. So like um, LGA 1155, LGA 1150, LGA 1151, LGA 1200, LGA 1700. Now, I don't know if I'm correct on... I think there was also like LGA 56, 1156. I might be wrong on some of these Intel ones because some of these are really old. Um, I know for a fact that LGA 1150 is Haswell and Broadwell. That I know. So Intel's 4th and 5th gen is 1150. Oh yeah, L how can we forget about LJ1366? 1366, oh, 1150, was this one 1156? Was I wrong by like one number or something? LJ11, was it 1155 or 1156? I forget. Anyway, that one's Haswell, or was it not 51? Is there both? This one is my favorite one. This one is, uh... Comet and Rocket. This one is Alder, Raptor, Raptor Plus. Um, that's the current one. I, th I think 1155 is Sandy and Ivy Bridge. I don't remember these other ones. I think this... One of these is like Skylake. Isn't this one Skylake? Well, I, this is where it gets weird, man. That is Nehalem. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. So, I don't know. Like, people in the chat can, like, chime in. This one also is Cabby Lake. So, these are some examples of sockets. So I'm just like recalling all this off the top of my head. I don't know if this is right or wrong. I, I'm pretty sure. So the ones I know for a fact are this one, this one, and these. Those I definitely know. Obviously the ones with the big circle because those are current. No, it did not actually go down. Oh, wait, no, yeah, the, the, no, what do you mean go down? Yes, yes, the pin count did go down. Yes. From here to here, yes, there was a reduction in five pins. And that was the whole point I was trying to make. The pin count doesn't always go up, is what I'm trying to say. It, it goes up and down, depending on the CPU architecture. So, this time around... Like, for example, guys, look at AMD. AMD went from 1331 to 1718 pins. So that's a big increase in pin count from AM4 to AM5. Comet Lake and Rocket Lake to Alder Lake saw a big increase, too. That's like a 500 pin increase right there. So that was a big increase in pin count to go to that big Alder Lake socket. And you know why they need all those pins? Mainly because of the E-cores. 
Those extra 500 pins, most of those are because of all the e-cores. That's why. Um, I forgot one more. I want to I wanna call out the... So the HEDT... Uh, man, I... Hmm, how many does Threadripper have? Threadripper, I think, is... Threadripper was, uh, what was that socket? It was like 3,073 or something. No, that, that's a very interesting number. No, I don't know what the Threadripper count was. I, I feel like it's 3,000 something. But you guys have to Google that one for me. I don't know how many Threadripper has. I, I think it's over 3,000. Or it's like 29 something pins. 4,094? Is that the current one though? Oh, that's the TR4? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. I'm trying to figure out, was that the first Threadripper? The old one, like Threadripper 1950X, 2950X, X399 was a chipset. Wasn't that one like 3,000 something pins? That's a lot of pins, 4,000? That intrigues me because that's something that I didn't actually know. I normally don't need to Google things while live. I normally know everything in my in my head ahead of time. But for Threadripper, I didn't know. Like, this one, I legitimately don't know. Um, I know Intel. Intel had LGA 1366, LGA 2011, LGA 2011 version 3 or something, or whatever they call it, like dash 3 or version 3 or whatever. Um, and then there was the the uh lga whatever the skylake x was 2066 i think was that one i don't remember i think it's 2066 yeah the threader has a lot of pins that one i know that one's like way up there and then intel didn't have an HTTP platform after that unless you count sapphire rapids which you can't buy anywhere these are intel's hedt and then amd had like the huge Threadripper socket, and maybe there was a difference between TR4 and the current TRX50. But just to give you guys an idea, these counts are the pin counts. Like, these are how many pins are on the CPUs that go in those sockets. Same thing with these, same thing with these. So... So this time around, the new socket is LGA 18, what was it, 1851? Yeah, 1851. And this one is Meteor and Arrow Lake. Oh, wow. Wow, okay. Yeah, that one I did not know at all. Yeah, I knew it was like a. I I, I was estimating it was like three thousand seven hundred something. For some reason, that number sticks out in my head. For some reason, that might be the Intel Sapphire Rapids or something, or some other Intel one. But yeah, like the the new upcoming one is going to have that many pins. So think about that. That one. So it's like a one hundred fifty one increase over LGA seventeen hundred. That means it's going to have more pins than AMD's current AM5 because AMD's not changing sockets. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's better or worse for increasing the pin count because keep in mind, this is still like way less than Intel's old HEDT platforms. Those things still had more pins than this Meteor Lake. Sapphire Rapids is... 4677, okay. We'll say LGA 4677. Because that's Intel, technically, you can't even buy one, but that's Intel's current HEDT. So AMD's current HEDT is this one. That's the one that I have. And then this is the Intel one, for those that are curious. So, and that makes more sense when you think about the server environment, because the servers use the exact same sockets. So Intel, Sir, Intel Xeons, they're using this right now. AMD Epic is using this. Just to give you guys an, 
a, a perspective on pin count in the server world. So, but the upcoming Arrow Lake is going to be using LGA 1851, if these rumors are true, which means that it's definitely a new socket, which means you definitely have to buy, like, if you want to go Intel, you're going to have to buy a new motherboard. That's the reason why 14th Gen is basically a big skip for a lot of people. Like, unless you're, unless you're on 12th Gen, there really is no reason to consider the 14th gen. It's basically a waste of, like, as, as Gamers Nexus would put it, it is a waste of sand. Like, quite literally. Um, but they gotta put something out there for the 2023 20, year. Because remember, guys, 14th gen is considered a 2023 product. So if you're thinking about buying 14th gen now... You're literally buying last year's model. So keep that in mind. Because we are getting Arrow Lake later this year. So um, all the Intel people out there, the time to upgrade is not yet. Like, it's t it's now is the time where you wait. Um, the AMD people, it's an easy upgrade. Like, you, it doesn't matter. If you're on AM4... If someone's on AM4, I would tell them right now the same thing I'm telling the people that are on Intel, wait. Although the Intel people got to wait longer. But I would still wait. Because you don't want to get buyer's remorse. You don't want to be that guy who bought a 2080 tie for $1,200 literally a month before the 3080 came out. You know, don't be that guy. Uh, or don't be the guy who bought the 3090 Ti Four months before the 4090 launched. You know, don't end up in that. You're going to have buyer's remorse. It's a feels bad. You don't want to, like, think of it like this. 3090 Ti uses so much more power than 4090, and it's slower. Like, don't be that person. It's the same deal here. Raptor Lake Plus 14900K uses so much power. It's a meme at this point for a CPU, a consumer CPU, to use more electricity than a server CPU. You know what I mean? The 1400K and especially the KS uses more electricity than my Threadripper, which has 4,844 pins. So, yeah, it's it's kind of a meme. So don't don't you don't want to be that person. So don't buy 14th gen because you're just going to set yourself up for disappointment when Arrow Lake comes out later this year so it's think of it like this think of it like this 20 for the intel crowd 2024 equals 2021 from a launch perspective What do I mean by that? Do we need to go over this again? March. I think it was March. I'm pretty sure it was March. Maybe it was April. Doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it. Spring 2021. What happened? What happened in the spring of 2021? Everybody's favorite AVX 512 CPU launch. That's what happened. 11900K launched the i9 11900K and all its ilk launched in the spring of 2001. Spring 2024 i9 14900KS launched. Check it out. Was it spring or was it winter? I think it might have been winter. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Basically, well, let's just say Q1 i9 1400KS launched. Do you guys see where I'm going with this? I think you guys know where I'm going with this. The fact that I mentioned 11th Gen Rocket Lake, that's foreshadowing the events of what are going, what's going to happen. So, fall 2021, specifically November 2021, what launched? 
What launched from Intel in 2021 fall? Q4. I9, 12900K. Bam. Double CPU launch. Two generations of CPUs launched in the exact same year. It was a double launch. So, just like... Now do you guys understand why I'm saying you don't buy Intel right now? Now is not the time. Because we know what's coming in the fall of 2024. I'm going to have to move this up here. I'm running out of space. I'm like literally legit running out of space. I'm just going to say 15 gen. I don't know what it's going to be. Well, okay. You know what? We'll just say... Core Ultra 200. I mean, that's what the thing said in the article. Coming this fall. So this is why you don't buy Intel right now. You're setting yourself up for failure. You're going to be the guy who's on that 11th gen CPU when all the other people are on the, the 12900K. You know what I'm saying? Or the 5800X 3D or some, whatever, you know, like even though that was newer than this. But anyway, that's why we don't buy Intel right now. <laughs> like, yeah, this is what I mean by we're in that waiting period. We're in that, we're in that off season. We're still in the off season, guys. We're in the off season. <laughs> so, um, yeah, anyway. Whoops, I deleted a socket. Oh, oh, that's kind of the end of that. So, let's think of, let me think about this. I want to think about something. So, Zen Plus was 2018 spring. Zen 2 was summer 2019. Zen 4 was fall or very late summer, but I guess early fall 2022. What was last year? Oh, last year was all that X3D stuff. Yeah, last year was X3D. So, okay. That means this year... This year, we're most likely getting... Zen 5 this summer. So that means Q3. And it's probably going to be the Ryzen 9 9950X. I don't know what they're going to call it. This sounds kind of weird to say, but, you know, they could just, that's what it is. It's the 9950X. I remember people kept saying 1300K sounds terrible. Um, so they thought that Intel was going to change the name after 12900K, but they didn't. So who knows? AMD's probably just going to do 9950X or something. So I think this is going to show up in the summer. The question that I always get is what about X3D? Because X3, everybody knows at this point that X3D is not going to heat up the room. X3D is the best gaming CPU. X3D is definitely the best gaming CPU if you play like multiplayer CPU bound games like um, any kind of MMO, any Korean MMO, uh, like Black Desert, like uh, Vindictus, Terra, although I don't even know if anyone still plays that. All those old games like Lineage, Final Fantasy XIV, um, WoW, although WoW runs on anything at this point, like a potato could run WoW most of the time, but yeah, X3D, like, any kind of, like, CPU bound, Dragon's Dogma 2 is the best example I can give you, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, uh, Throne in Liberty, when that game comes out, that game is extremely CPU heavy, uh, just FYI, and, you know, any MMO, any kind of, like, multiplayer, like, those type of CPUs that tend to have a lot of people. I'm not talking about shooters. Shooters, they, like, a lot of things run shooters fine. But I'm talking about, like, games that have lots of player characters crowded in a lobby, lots of random big open-world PvP sessions, like New World. Like, those are the sort of CPUs, or those are the sort of games that... 
benefit the most from X3D. Star Citizen. Star Citizen is an extremely good example of why X3D is the way to go. The Last of Us, yeah, all those type of, those are single player games, but yeah, those, those are single player CPU heavy games. Um, X3D is the way to go, but I don't think we're going to see X3D, yeah, Baldur's Gate 3, oh, Baldur's Gate 3, man, that's a game that loves X3D Vcash, that, it loves 3D Vcash, it can't get enough of that, that's like, that's like glucose high for, uh, BG3 with an X3D, it cannot, it will keep eating that cash until it give until BG3 gives itself diabetes, like, no joke, for real, okay, um, 9950X, this summer, I expect 16 core, 32 thread, and then all the same core counts probably down the stack. Uh, there was an interesting rumor about like 10 core CPUs. I don't really see the point, or like 10 core CCD, which could mean like a Ryzen 7 with 10 cores, 20 threads, and a Ryzen 9 with 20 cores, 40 threads. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, that was a that was a rumor from a year ago and I haven't heard anything since then. So I think it's still going to be like 16 core 32 thread is the top end. Um but it's going to have some pretty good from what I've seen online uh it's going to have some really good integer performance and then floating point for the AI stuff. Now I don't know if these desktop parts are going to have the NPUs, which are the AI processors, the the AI cores. I don't know if these are going to have them. I know the laptops have them. I don't know if the desktops have them. So if they do, it means that you depending on how many AI cores these CPUs have, typically it's probably going to be like 2 to 4 if I had to guess. If you have a 16 core, you add four AI cores. You know, it's like having four E cores or four NPUs. That'll be like a 20 core chip on a 16, 16 plus four or 16 plus two. If it's like two, you know what I'm saying? So uh, we could be looking at a, a different kind of like a, almost like a big core, little core on AMD. Although I have no idea if that's what they're going to do. Uh, I'm just saying it could be interesting. We could see something like that. I wouldn't be surprised if they just show up out of the blue and they've got like these little cores on there for AI. So that'll be interesting to see. Intel, um, they're the ones I know less about. I know that they're doing tiles, which is basically chiplets. So they're basically going to be the same as AMD in terms of having different, different manufactured dies that do different parts of the CPU. Like the integrated graphics are going to be on their own chip. The cores are on their own chip. I don't know how they're going to do the IMC on Arrow Lake. But that one will be interesting. Uh, Intel will be very interesting. Because, in fact, I th honestly, I do think that Intel Intel's launch will be more interesting than AMD's launch this year. Because AMD is keeping the same socket. So, uh, that being said, AMD's launch will be more interesting than... 13th gen was when it launched because 13th gen launched with the exact same socket as 12th gen but it came with new motherboards and those motherboards were a lot better for higher speed ddr5 but 13th gen was not that like it, it, it is faster than alder lake but it, it achieves that mostly through factory overclock and higher power limits. That's how 13th gen is faster than Alder Lake. And it's obviously it's a more mature process. So they're able to run them more reliably at the higher uh, speeds. Because you couldn't really do that. Like if you overclock Alder Lake. You're not going to be able to match Raptor Lake. Because Raptor Lake can just overclock itself. And then go even faster. So you know. But they're already kind of maxed out. So. Um, what I'm saying is Zen 5. Because it's the same socket. As Zen 4, it's going to be kind of similar to 13th Gen Intel. Because 13th Gen Intel, it's backwards compatible with 12th Gen's chipset. Zen 5 is the same thing. It's going to be backwards compatible with the existing X670 and B650 boards. 
same socket, same everything. Probably same power limits. Uh, the only thing that could end up happening is they have even more efficient CPUs, so they run with less power. That will be really nice. Who knows? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they keep the same power limits, but they make tweaks to the IHS so the CPUs run cooler. I expect DDR5 to be improved in the sense that training is probably faster and more robust so that it doesn't have to retrain once a month or something after a certain number of boot cycles. So, Because that's currently something that Zen 4 does for some weird reason. I don't really know why. Um, but, yeah. That's basically Zen 5 in a nutshell. So, But it's going to be an excellent upgrade for anybody who is still on a DDR4 based platform. So if you're on AM4 or if you're on like an old Intel, like a Skylake, like a 6000 series Intel or anything older or anything that's DDR4, you know, like Zen 5 is probably going to be a massive, massive upgrade regardless of what DDR4 platform you're on. So that'll be interesting. But the Intel one, Intel socket is more interesting because it's a new socket, new motherboard, new everything, new like architecture, um, and we don't know much about it. So, but we will once the summer rolls around. I'm pretty sure the leaks for Arrow Lake are going to start rolling through. We do kind of know that Meteor Lake was kind of a dud. So, but that was on mobile, and Intel and power efficiency do not go in the same sentence typically. So, and that's probably why Meteor Lake was underperforming. But on desktop, we could see a different story. Because Intel can blast power and get results on desktop that they can't really do in mobile. So, we'll see what ends up happening. I think it's going to be very interesting. If Intel can half the power, it'll be interesting. I don't think they're going to half the power. They, I expect they'll probably use less power. I think it would be embarrassing if they use more power. They can't really do more power. So they can only go down. I don't think it's going to be half. But I think it's going to be less than what 14th gen uses. But in order to be competitive, they're going to blast power within reason so that they can get the results they need to be competitive. Otherwise, if it's like half the power, it's probably not going to be that competitive, to be honest. So... Because Meteor Lake was not competitive with, like, Zen 4 on mobile. So that's the reason why I don't think... I don't think Arrow Lake's going to be, quote-unquote, energy efficient. Because if we've already seen how Meteor Lake performs on mobile. And it's not that good. So they have to blast power to get results at the end of the day. So that's, um, yeah, that's going to be that one. So we go back here. So it was pictured. And yeah, that this is the, that is the socket. Because it says in the picture LGA 1851. So the latch mechanism looks exactly the same as LGA 1700. This is a small mini ITX board. It looks like a laptop. It looks like it's got SODIMM RAM. In The Last of Us, Intel can use up to 3x more power for the same FPS. Really? Wow. Wow. Yeah, somebody was telling me in my Discord that they have a 14700K and it uses like 280 watts. 280 watts. So, to, okay, to put things into perspective, 280 watts is more power while gaming than my Threadripper uses in gaming. So, that is... that, And that's an i7. That isn't even an i9. And it, that, that just shows how, how out of control things have gotten with the power consumption. But hey, when the majority when the majority party has issues with efficiency, they still succeed. So, it's like, you know, Intel's still the market leader compared to AMD in the CPU space by a large large margin. So, even if Intel's inefficient with Arrow Lake and they blast power and it's like 300 watts, 
and nothing changes. Uh, as long as it's competitive, no one really cares. People are still going to end up buying it. Like, it's just how it is. Um, even though there's a much better alternative in terms of energy efficiency. Yeah, what's this thing? Oh, this was an older article. I think I covered this one last week. Let's find a different one. Montage technology initiates trial production of 7200 MTs DDR5 and everything faster speeds. So this is looks like um uh, is this montage but are they using micron because the oh it's Rambus. That's um yeah, I don't know who that is, but that that's like a Chinese company or Taiwan company. It's like either Taiwanese or Chinese, but anyway, I actually have Rambus in one of my old laptops. But the um, once Micron gets memory speeds up to like seventy two hundred, then I think then we're gonna see some more interesting memory kits from like Hynix and stuff. Which is better, MSI Mag B six fifty M? Wi-Fi or ASRock B650 Pro RS Wi-Fi? Uh, probably the ASRock because the the mag, the B650M is an MATX. That's a micro ATX board, if I remember correctly. And I don't like the small motherboards. So I'm just going to say ASRock B650 Pro RS is better. Because it gives you more options. The other one doesn't. The small motherboards? I don't like the small motherboards. But that's just me. So just based off of that fact alone, I would say ASRock's better. ASRock B650 Pro RS Wi-Fi. Oh wait, this is a small motherboard too. Are you trying to do a small form factor build? Is this supposed to be small form factor? Uh, this one looks decent. Two, four, six, seven USB. It has Wi-Fi. Uh, B. Well, it's still small though. It's still it's still MATX. This one? Oh, wait, they're both MATX. So, which one? You're asking which one's better. Well, this one, this one. Uh, hold on. Does this one have a picture of the. Two, four, six, seven. With a Type C, twenty gigabit. This is two, four, six, seven. With a what? I, I can't tell if that's twenty or ten. Usually, if it doesn't say, it's usually a ten gig. Doesn't say. You have to look at the manual. They're very similar. Whoops, not that. Display port and HDMI. Display port and HDMI. Wi Fi antenna. Wi Fi antenna. They're honestly, they're very similar. The one thing I will call out though is MSI's got better USB ports on the back. MSI has three. 10 gig type A and one 20 gig type C and then it has four 5 gig blue ones. The ASRock one has Okay, hold on. Wait a minute. So those are all 10. Yeah, so the ASRock one has two 5 gig, four 480 meg 
and two 10 gig, one type A, one type C. So the the MSI actually has the better I.O. on the back. On top of that, the MSI one has the full 5.1 analog audio and the SPDIF out, the optical audio, whereas the ASRock does not have that. So based off of that, and they're both MATX, that looks like an X4 and an X16. This one looks like... Why is this gallery so bad? Why am I unable to see the bottom of the picture? What happened? Why does it look like this? Okay. One, two, so this one has an X1. Well, you'll never be able to use it because of the GPU. This one, okay. They're basically, in terms of PCIe slot, because this X1 is here, technically that is more, but you're never going to use it. So, MSI is still better because the back is better. So, yep, MSI wins. The MSI one wins because it has more... Okay, it doesn't have more. It has faster USB ports. So, I would go with this one. Yeah, there's one, two, three, four SATA... What is this? One, two, two SATA. Oh, three, four, four SATA. Both have four SATA. Both have the 3.0 front. Where is the where is the 3.0 front on this? Oh, it's right angled. M.2. M.2. This one has two M.2. This one has two M.2s that both have heat sinks. So yeah, this one has a really big heat sink. This one has this one has like a two smaller heat sinks. So I don't know, man. The ASRock one has a better heat sink for the primary M.2. Is that a Gen 5? No, it's Gen 4. No, yes, it's Gen 5. It's Gen 5. So this one has Gen 5. Does this one have not Gen This one doesn't have Gen 5, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. So the difference is the MSI does not have gen 5 at all it's all gen 4 there's no gen 5 at all this has gen 5 on the s on that top ssd the one with the big heat sink is gen 5 so it's like do you want gen 5 storage or do you want faster usb ports assuming that actually matters because this one honestly um this 10 gig 10 gig and 10 gig USB-C and then like the 5 gig. That's enough speed. Uh, having said that though, if I was going to build a VR PC and I had to pick between these two motherboards, hands down, I'd go with the MSI board. The MSI board's a better VR motherboard because it has better USB. It has more higher speed USB and that's ultimately why it would win. I don't know which one's more expensive. If I had to guess, I would think the MSI one is more expensive. Because it has faster USB. It's got more heat sinks. Although ASRock has a faster M.2. So maybe, maybe they end up being the same price. Because you got Gen 5 on ASRock. You don't have that on MSI. But MSI has fast, like mostly faster USB. So, I don't know. Like It, it ends up being kind of a wash. But if I had to choose, if I had to choose, I would go with the MSI board. Because of the USB. That's the answer. Not everybody needs a T700 Gen 5 SSD. So it's like, if you're not going to use this, the MSI is the way to go. I mean, you can still use one of these. A Gen 4 TN470, which is like 7300 megabyte per second uh, read so okay uh, yeah we already talked about this so that's kind of dependent on what happens with the new CPUs 
Same thing with this. Okay, let's talk about AI. Every time we hear the word NVIDIA, it always goes hand in hand with AI. So, this is actually good news. Good news for all the AI startup companies and also the big enterprise companies uh, that are wanting to buy AI chips. So NVIDIA's AI GPU shortage is finally over. And we've been talking about this story for over a year. And I remember saying oh, more than a year ago now about the 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 uh, 52 week lead time, basically one year lead time. They got it all the way down to eight to 12 weeks. That's pretty much standard now. So that's like not, that's nothing to, to complain about. That's pretty much how it goes with build to order uh, semiconductor devices. So, you know, this is, uh, this is good news. Now, all we need now all we need literally is crypto to move off of CPU rise in CPU mining back to GPU mining. So then all the GPUs can go out of stock. And then we can't buy GPUs anymore. Hey Dia, thanks for the sub by the way. Appreciate it. But now that AI is kind of cooling down a little bit in terms of availability, watch crypto come back. <laughs> That's like even worse. Crypto's even worse. You know why? I'd rather take AI shortages over like crypto waves because <sighs> the problem with crypto is when the demand for crypto was really, really high for like mining hardware, that basically means that the mid-range of the market gets wiped out. Like all your 4060 TIs, your 4070s, your 7800 XTs, your 7900 GREs. Those things will literally disappear overnight if crypto on GPU mining comes back. Now, remember a year ago, in fact, I, yeah, it was more than a year ago. Remember, guys, I said that crypto always comes back like every year. There's like a there's usually like a period where crypto is like everyone's mining and then they're not mining and then they're mining again and they're not mining again. So like examples that I can give you 2014 crypto was in uh, then it was not. So 2015, nobody cared. 2017, crypto came back. 2018, it crashed. 2021-ish, 2020, like end of 2020, into 2021, crypto came back. It was like the biggest one ever. And that's why no, and that combined with the GPU supply shortages, no one could buy anything. And scalpers had control of the market and crypto companies were sidestepping retail and buying direct from the actual AIBs. It was a huge mess. Then it crashed. When Ethereum went proof of stake, it all crashed. Back in the summer of 2022. Now, it's almost two years later. Crypto's coming back. It's already back. But the thing is, it is not back in the same form. Now... You have people mining crypto on Ryzen CPUs. Check this out. Check this out. AMD Ryzen 9 7950X CPU. Yeah, we've got one. Is more profitable in mining than the fastest GPUs as crypto once again sees rise after Bitcoin jump. This story was almost a month, literally all about a month ago was when this story, I didn't cover it at the time, but we're going to talk about it a little bit here because I haven't talked about crypto in a while. This is something, if you're someone who doesn't care about crypto, you can skip this part and just tune this out. But the thing is, it's in your best interest to be aware of these market forces that are at work behind the scenes so that you don't get blindsided when you go try to buy computer hardware later this year. 
However, thanks to the AMD CPUs, and particularly the Ryzen 9 CPUs, meaning the dual CCD CPUs, so think 12-core and 16-core Ryzen, they are considered... The f they're more profitable than mining on like a 4090. So why would someone buy 750X to mine if the 4090 is faster at mining? It's all about economics. It's all about return on investment, a.k.a. ROI. The amount of time it takes for someone to go and buy spend money to buy a 750x and then mine on it for days and weeks 24 7 the amount of time it'll take them to break even and start profiting is significantly less time than if they spend like two grand or so anywhere from like 1700 to two grand on a 4090 think about how long it would take you to make back that much money mining crypto on the 4090 it's going to take more than a year to make back that money so it's like was it even worth it you got to look at opportunity cost so that's the reason why cpu mining is the way to go in 2024 so the ryzen 9 750x has become the most popular mining option earning more profits than the fastest GPUs as the crypto craze once again picks up on cue, on schedule. I said it more than a year ago. There's plenty of live streams of me talking about this topic of crypto coming and going. I said it would come back in 2024. Here it is. I wasn't lying. I wasn't making this up. I have no insider knowledge. I say it and it comes true. That's how it is. So here we go. CPUs more viable than GPUs in certain mining algorithms. Crypto rises from the ashes as Bitcoin hits 73,000 US dollars. So here we go all over again, guys. This, it's all, it's happening over again. Cubic, Zeph, QRL, all these other coins. I don't know what any of these coins are. I've never heard of these coins before. Because um, I haven't really been paying attention to the altcoins since Ethereum went proof of stake. Other than like Solana and Monero or XMR, like, you know, so. Okay, here we go. Let's see what it says here. It's not the first time that CPUs are used for crypto mining, but with the recent rise of Bitcoin surpassing 60K and hitting up to 73K US dollars, it looks like the mining craze has returned, even if for the time being. This has led to people dusting off. They're all here. We go. They're coming out of the. Uh, they're coming out of the woodwork. Watch out! They're coming out of the woodwork. It's it's happening again. That electrical grid is going to get strained. Their old mining system firing them back up to earn the crypto gold while the craze lasts. Okay, this has led to a rise in demand for AMD Ryzen CPUs. So. What brought this to my attention, although I was already kind of aware of it, at least vaguely, because I said it a year ago, that this is going to happen. I just remember, guys, what I said at the time. I said, we don't know in what form crypto will come back. And it's back, but it's on CPUs this time. Now, this was brought to my attention the last time I went to Micro Center, which was about a week ago. I went to Micro Center, and I was talking to the sales guy, and he was telling me that... We can't keep these CPUs, these Ryzen 9 CPUs, in stock. Particularly the, the 5950X, the 5900X, and the 7950X. These CPUs sell like hotcakes right now because of crypto. It's all because of crypto. He was telling me how... They'll get a random web order where someone's trying to order like five CPUs and they're always trying to order the dirt cheap motherboard and they're trying to cash in on like the cheap, the free RAM. See, what's made this even more lucrative for someone who's wanting to like start mining on CPUs, if you live near a micro center and your electricity costs per month is relatively cheap, 
It's actually pretty easy to do this because you can literally get free DDR5 with the purchase of a Ryzen CPU and a motherboard. And it's like, you're going to have to use the motherboard. So you might as well just capitalize on that bundle so that you save money on that upfront cost. So that, that makes it even easier to get into CPU mining when you think of it like that. So if you're not near a micro center, then it's a little bit more expensive because you have to pay for the DDR5. And that is the reason why the AM4 socket is still so popular because the 5950X is relatively cheap. Like it's on clearance now, I think, at most places. And the 5900X is also really good. Uh, and you probably still have DDR4. And DDR4 is relatively cheap and you only need like one stick. So it's not hard. So this has also led to a rise in demand for Ryzen 7000 CPUs in certain currencies, such as Cubic, which takes advantage of AVX. Okay, here we go. So this is this is something that Zen 3 can't do, but this is only for the people who want to mine Cubic because Cubic can use either AVX2. Well, AVX2 works on like a 5950X. That works on like any modern CPU from the last 10 years or so. Or AVX512, here it is, the magic sauce. AVX512, which works on the Ryzen 7000 series. And this is the reason why they can't keep these things in stock at Micro Center. So, which the Zen 4 architecture is very good at, since it is the only client and widely available option that supports the ISA. That's true, because Intel, Intel gave up on offering AVX512 in its current offerings since Alder Lake. So basically, since the second wave of 12th gen Intel, which was basically the very beginning of 2022, Intel abandoned AVX512 on the consumer desktop. That doesn't mean that Intel doesn't support AVX512, they just don't support it on the consumer desktop. If you want AVX512 on Intel, you have to pony up the cash for an extremely expensive Xeon. So that, that's one of the reasons why nobody mines on Intel. The other reason, and the more general reason, why if you want to mine crypto, you got to go AMD Ryzen, is because Ryzen, for whatever reason, has always been good at cryptography and data compression and decompression. If you look at the benchmarks for 7-zip, um, just regular extracting compressed files, and then SHA uh, cryptography benchmarks, or SHA, I should say. AMD, hands down, destroys Intel in these benchmarks. Like, it isn't even close. Like, a 14900K will lose to, like, a 7700K, or a 7700X in these type of benchmarks. Like, in, in cryptography-related tasks. So that shows you guys, like, how much more efficient and performant AMD Ryzen is in cryptography. And cryptography, hashing, de decrypting hashes, AMD Ryzen is so good at this. That is the reason why it's, it's a perfect fit for crypto. Because literally, crypto is just hash. It's just hash rate. It's all about hash values. So it's all about decrypting and encrypting uh, codes. That's all it's doing. And, and Ryzen is literally, I don't know, like, I don't want to say literally made for this. It's just, it just so happens that Ryzen is so good at this use case. And that's the reason why it's better to mine on Ryzen than it is on any GPU. So, like, at least from an ROI standpoint. So, and it's all about ROI. That's the name of the game. So, anyway, previously, AMD CPUs were used for Raptorium mining. Hilarious how that name is Raptorium. AMD's better at, rap, at, at mining Raptorium than Raptor Lake. That's hilarious. Which took advantage of the massive L3 cache featured on Ryzen and Threadripper. Especially the 3D V cache. Oh, that's scary, guys. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. If it's good at if the 3D V cache is the way to go, 
That means no one, no gamer is going to be able to buy a 7800X 3D. Or I guess maybe the dual CCDs. You know what's funny? That is like a way to move all the stock of the 7900X 3D, which everyone seems to always forget about. Like everyone always just goes for the 7800X 3D, or they just go for the top dog 7950X 3D, and they just kind of skip the 7900X 3D. So maybe all the crypto people can buy up the 7900X 3D. Because it has a large pool of cash stacked on top of the chips. If you search up the current mining profit rates, the cubic coin generates a profit of around $3 every 24 hours using the chip. So you can imagine if someone has like, well, if we do the math, like if someone has 12 CPUs mining, you know, that's like, what, $36 a day? So you got to subtract your your power cost. So the chip includes the electricity cost while running. When running, the chip at 170 watts. So the funny thing about this is you can use Curve Optimizer to lower the power consumption. And if it's X3D, X3D tops down to like 120 watts. It's like 50 watts less than the non-X3D. So... Like, that's even less power without Curve Optimizer. That's just stock. So, given the fantastic efficiency that Zen 4 CPUs have to offer... And you know what's funny? Most of the mining rigs that you'll see... They're literally just using Wraith Prism coolers. Like, they're using the stock air coolers for the for their setups. So, they're, they're literally reducing the cost as much as possible. Cheap included box coolers from old CPUs... Uh, plus, you know, Microsoft free or uh, Microsoft Micro Center free DDR5, <laughs> free DDR5. You know, I was like, what? Okay, so that's how they're able to minimize the the initial investment cost. So, so typically, uh, well, they show this list of ones I don't even recognize, but that that is very interesting. This is the Nvidia RTX 4090. Profitability calculator. So RTX 4090 can make about $1.75 at best. Versus $3 on the Ryzen CPU? How is the Ryzen CPU that much faster? That doesn't make it... What? What? With AMD 750X, you could generate almost twice as much profit in crypto mining versus the RTX 4090. Man, a CPU beating a GPU at crypto is hilarious. That's that's hilarious. Like, what happened? Which offers a max... Oh, AVX 512 happened. That's what happened. Which offers a maximum profit of one... So basically, at best, a 4090 makes a dollar ninety. Like, that's at best, using... Using a uh, fee or nex, the GPU has a maximum power draw of 450 watts and also features a 3.5x higher price. So they're using these dollar values to compute these profit margins. So $559 for a 750x, and that's actually not, that's actually very pricey compared to what you can get if you buy one at Micro Center. Because Micro Center, these are like sub 500 now. Uh, they're around they're around 489. I've seen them go from like 4 489 all the way to like 519 is typically the price of these. Um, or versus like two thousand dollars 490. So yeah, um, that is an interesting story. The heightened demand for Ryzen 7000 CPUs, including 750X, has led to a temporary shortage of the chip. That is correct. You can't actually buy one at Micro Center, or not Micro Center. Well, Micro Center, they often sell out, but like places like Newegg, you can't even get them. Other markets are affected too, though not as much. The crypto craze has just picked up recently, and this is only the beginning. Crypto waves last pretty long. They're typically like a whole year to a year and a half. So we'll see what happens. My fear is that um, we're coming up on a CPU launch in a few months with Zen 5, and I want a Zen 5 CPU, 
I don't want to be dealing with scalpers and bots and crypto mining people trying to buy up Zen 5, especially since I want the flagship CPU, and it seems like it's the high core count ones are the ones that they're targeting, like the 7850X. So yeah, that's not good for someone like me or anyone who's looking to upgrade this summer and be on a new platform. So that's not good. Furthermore, if more mining algorithms take advantage of AVX 512, then it looks like things won't be great. Oh, see? Oh, this is exact. This is my worst fears might be realized. If more mining algorithms take advantage of AVX 512, it looks like things won't be great for AMD's Zen 5 CPU supply. As Kepler underscore L2 reports that the next gen AMD chip architecture is going to offer twice the AVX 512 performance of Zen 4. And that's going to be a major benefit in crypto mining. Hashtag Zen 5 LHR. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to have to implement, like, LHR in the BIOS. Oh, man. Most CPU mining algos use AVX 512, where Zen 5 has 2x the performance of Zen 4. Man, that Zen 5's looking really good now. The AMD Zen 5 CPUs are expected to launch in both Ryzen and desktop and laptop later this year, so it looks like we may see AMD implement a certain hat. No, I don't think they're going to do anything. <laughs> they're not going to do anything. AMD's not going to do anything, guys. They're going to go for that performance crown. Uh, but it means that people are going to be buying these things like crazy when they come out. That's hilarious. Because you can get the most dirt cheap B650 micro ATX or even like an ITX board because you remember you don't need a GPU at all all you need is RAM a motherboard a power supply and the CPU that's it so and the CPU is what like 170 watts you can get a dirt cheap power supply it doesn't even have to be 80 plus gold it can be 80 you can be 80 plus bronze 80 plus nothing just get one of those cheap power supplies, throw that on there, cheap air cooler. You know, this is not an Intel. You don't need a liquid cooler. You just stick a, a, a cheap air cooler on there, Curve optimizer minus 15 or minus 10 or whatever. You don't even have to do like a massive undervolt, just whatever. Load line calibration, that thing up. It, it Literally, because it's going to run 24-7 at the same speed all the time mining crypto, you set curve optimizer probably to like negative 15. If you're, if you're being lazy, negative 15. LLC, like level 3 or whatever. Done. That's it. Done deal. The cheapest DDR5, 4800 JDEC, no heat spreader. You know, 16 gigs, what 8 gigs even, whatever. I, I mean, maybe the memory does matter actually, but um, I'm going to guess like cheap Micron, JDEC, 5200 or less is all that's needed and that's basically it because all you care about is avx 512 like that's literally the name of the game so man this is fascinating i might have to do more research on this and might have to make a more in-depth video on cpu mining because it's back guys crypto is back amazing People are using even older CPUs. Yeah, I know I know that the 3900X and the 3950X are very, very popular for CPU mining. Because you can get them on the used market for cheap. But as the demand goes up for crypto, as all things go, the price, the used market value will go up. Because people are buying these things. So for a, an actual real world use case... Do be curious to see if you can do anything with the 3060? Well, I don't know. See, the thing is, the problem is all these coins, supposedly, they all leverage AVX 512. And I think if, if I was a programmer who develops the crypto algorithm, the reason why these... CPUs are so good for the mining stuff is because you're trying to reduce the amount of power consumption required per node 
And we all know that GPUs use way more electricity than CPUs. So, yeah. Met saying 11700K and 11900K would be good also. Yeah, they, they would. Those would be good. Unfortunately, though, here's the weird thing about that. Because everybody hated so much on Rocket Lake... Gamers Next is called Rocket Lake a waste of sand and did the whole like Thanos thing in the thumbnail for that video that uh, unfortunately because of that Ro uh, Rocket Lake was so short lived I feel like Intel manufactured less Rocket Lake than like any other one of their CPU generations except for possibly 7th gen I think Cabby Lake also was very short lived so unfortunately, because Rocket Lake was so hated by the general public, no one, like, there's not a lot of them in circulation. So that being said, you got to keep in mind that Rocket Lake is not going to perform as well as, like, the Ryzen 9. Because the CPUs that everyone seems to be buying are the Ryzen 9. They're all buying 12 or 16 core. I don't see a lot of people buying 6 core and 8 core CPUs to do this crypto. So there's something about return on investment where you want to go dual CCD for whatever reason, whether it's bandwidth or something. Like, you gotta go... Like, I, I, I've seen a couple of videos on this subject, and there was one guy talking about... If you want to do CPU mining, step one is you got to buy the right CPUs. And he, he emphasized Ryzen 9. He said, don't buy Ryzen 7. Don't buy Ryzen 5. Only buy Ryzen 9 because you want that high core count. So the, the problem with Rocket Lake is because it is... First of all, there's two problems. Number one, there's not enough of them in circulation. Number two, they only scale to eight cores. So it's basically like, that would be kind of like a, like a 5800X. A 5800X. You know, like no one really wants to use that. I mean, well, okay, no, I take that back. Because 5800X doesn't have AVX512. So it's kind of like a 7700X. It's like a 7700X. And as far as I know... No one, none of these people that are mining crypto are using eight core CPUs. They're like, some of them probably are like if they're starting out, but the serious people who are like literally buying these weekly from micro center and new egg, and they're ordering them in larger quantities. They're definitely only using like 12 core, 16 core. So yeah. So rocket Lake in theory, it would be good, but in practice, I don't think people care about it because it's only eight cores. Like that's that's the one drawback about it. And there's not enough of them. They're not in. They're not in. Like there's not a lot in circulation. So it's kind of rare. Um, I mean, I've got one, but uh, yeah. So this is a fascinating topic. Like I'm not someone who's that into like crypto mining. But I watch out for this. You want to be aware of this because this could impact your upgrade decisions if this bleeds over into the gaming PC market. And now people who want to build a gaming PC, they can't upgrade because, you know, some crypto guy just bought up all the CPUs in the local micro center. So that's the thing to watch out for with stuff like this. I don't know if GPUs will become popular again for mining. GPUs, they tend to be really popular and then like no one cares about them and then they're really popular again. Like in 20... When was the first time like CPU mining became a thing? I think it was like 2018 or something. Like GPUs are popular, then they fell off and then people started doing CPU mining but it was really never what it is today. Then GPU mining came back. Then CPU mining on laptops became a thing. Like, I remember, um, man, let me see. Yeah, remember this? Remember this, when this was a thing? 
laptop mining. See, now that that to me is stupid. Like that to me is whoever's doing this, they're not gonna break even. Like that's, I don't know, man. Unless unless this is like some really really cheap laptop. That's hilarious. That's kind of eerie. That's like a kind of like a scary movie. You see, like you, you turn around, there's like all these laptops in your room, just like sitting on the tables and stuff. And they're just like all arch, like they're able to walk and move around on their own. That's kind of creepy. That's hilarious though. This was when people were mining on RTX 30 series back in the day. This is February 2021. Laptop mining. It was a real deal. Ryzen 5 3600 non-X is what I have laying around. Mini PC mining? Possibly. That's ridiculous, though. Mining. Oh, wow. Look, man. EVGA literally made a power supply with the word mining on the name. 1,300-watt mining. 80-plus gold. Does it have a lot of, like, uh... Why does it have Molex? <laughs> Or like the old, old Molex, the 4-pin. Like, why does it have that if it's a mining power supply? That is bizarre. Anyway, but say, like, this is the thing. It's coming back. It's coming back. Ryzen mining. Like, there was a time when people were mining on um, PlayStation 5s. Malfunctioning PlayStation 5s. Find a second home in Azrock's BC 250 mining rig. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> See what I mean? Um, hacker targets Java exploit at HP's AMD Epic CPU powered servers for Raptorium crypto mining. Mines over 100,000 US dollars in eight days. See? Unusual XFX Radeon RX. 6700 this is basically ps5 gpu pictured in the wild yeah i remember remember guys the 6700 there was two purposes one was it's the ps5 the second was for mining they literally made this as a mining card that's funny i have one <laughs> I, I never used it for mining i mean I, I have it so i can i can replicate ps5 performance on pc it's hilarious. Raptorium. Yeah, Raptorium was in that recent article too for like mining. Yeah, see I remember this is the picture. This is the picture that I remember. See this? Look at that. Look at all those Wraith Prism stock coolers. Wraith Prism stock coolers. On the, that actually, that motherboard looks like it has a chipset fan on it. That's, that's a X570. That's a full-size X5, why would you mine on an X570? You want to mine on like a B, a B550. Why would you spend money on an X570 just to mine? Like that's, that's overkill. But yeah, like this is the sort of thing. You stick an air cooler on there. Uh, any random cheap air cooler, that's all you need. You don't really need, like, any fancy cooler. It's easy, man. A AMD literally just works. You just buy one. You set it up. You can mine crypto on it. <laughs> you can do whatever. You don't need a liquid cooler. You don't need fancy uh, VRMs for the motherboard. It literally just works. Man, that's funny. Uh, okay, this article's old. This was before Zen 4. But you can see, like, the dual CCD, 5950X, the 5900, the 3950X, all that stuff. Like, all the dual CCD ones are the to chart toppers. So, like, these are the ones. You wish EVGA would make a 3 or 4, 8 pin connector for their older PSUs. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is with EVGA. EVGA is kind of falling apart, unfortunately. I haven't seen any new product announcements from them in a long time. E 
EVGA is dying. Yeah, but this is, man, all this, the crypto coming back. That's kind of, that's scary. That's scary because I want a Zen 5 CPU. Uh, there's going to be a new refresh of the AI professional server card. MI300 is going to get refreshed to MI350. Oh no, does that mean we're going to see a, a, uh, 7750 XT and a 7850 XT? If they're doing the 50 thing in the Enterprise, is this foreshadowing of things to come in the future? I doubt it because AMD should be launching RDNA 4 this year. So, in some capacity, I don't know, but that's, uh, that's interesting. Since there are no PSUs to have the native cable. Not, no, no EVGA ones. Yeah, they don't have that. Wait, what? Intel 13th Gen Raptor Lake. S unlocked boxed discontinued. Oh, that means uh, this is discontinued. I knew one day I'd be saying goodbye to this thing. So that means that the fancy box, the fancy box, because I, I will admit I like I like the i9 packaging. I like the fancy thing in here. Um, you can't get this anymore. They're discontinuing it. So they've already done this with Alder Lake. Like Alder Lake came with a giant golden one. If you buy an Alder Lake brand new, like a, a 12900K today for Micro Center, it comes in this rinky-dink tiny little box. I saw it the other week when I was there. I was disappointed. But the guy was telling me that it's just Intel trying to cost. They're doing cost cutting because the the larger the packaging, the more expensive it is to ship. So every they're trying to nickel and dime by like reducing the size of these things. So at least the boxes. So it's it's yeah. Basically, if you're trying to buy like a twelve nine hundred K, the twelve nine hundred K comes in a box. It's exactly the same as like the i seven and the i five box. It's like a small little thing. So that means thirteen nine hundred K is going to run into the same problem. No more fancy packaging for thirteen nine hundred K. Fourteen nine hundred K will continue though to have the same packaging. At least for the rest of the year. Um, what is this? The Elder Scrolls TV? Elder Scrolls TV show unlikely to happen? Says Howard. Man, what was this guy's name? Something Howard? I forgot his name. Uh... Man, what was this guy's name? I forget his name. The guy who uh, was in all the interviews about Starfield. Some EVGA peripherals you haven't seen restock. Man, what is this guy's name? Sam Howard? Ben Howard? What was this guy's name? Dan Howard? I forgot the guy's name. Anyway... Ryzen 7, 8700F and 8400F iGPU-less APUs, launch for global markets with limited OEM. Yeah, this this makes sense to make this OEM only. However, I don't understand the purpose of this, this product. Someone from AMD is going to have to explain, like, what is the reason for this? Because the whole advantage of the APU is it sacrifices the cash for the the integrated graphics. So if you remove the graphics then what is the advantage what like what's the reason for this thing? I don't understand. Especially since it's going to be OEM only. At first I was like, okay, it's OEM only because I can't see why anybody would buy this to build their own PC because part of the appeal of the 7800G. Yeah, Todd Howard. Thanks, Disconnect. Yeah, that's his name. Todd Howard. 
Part of the appeal is the integrated graphics. So much of the appeal, actually, of this part is the integrated graphics. So if you remove the integrated graphics, what's the point of this thing? Like, why would somebody buy this instead of like a, a 7700X? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't understand what this is for. They can sell them off as budget in bulk like they did with 5500X. Like, if these were good at crypto mining, maybe this would be like a dirt cheap way to do crypto mining. Who knows, right? Like, this is only eight cores, and apparently you need to do, like, dual CCD if you want to mine crypto. So, I don't know what the use case is for this. It's OEM only, which means you can't really build mining rigs with it, because why would you buy pre-built to mine? So, I, I don't really know what this is for. It's a weird segment. It's definitely not in the enthusiast target demographic, so I don't even know who this is for. Or that, like, I don't know. Oh, this is weird. Because it's like, you're going to have to... This means that you have to use a discrete graphics card. And why would you... You know what I mean? Like, what? It's weird. Okay, here's an interesting one. So, oh, I wanted to talk about this earlier. So, AMD Strix Point APUs with RDNA 3 Plus iGPU should match the RX 6400 with 12 CUs. RTX 3050 with 16 CUs. That is very interesting. Considering that the, what was the actual 3050? I guess this one. There's a new one, which is hilarious. GA, I guess this one. Or should we be talking about mobile? Wow, that means... That means a the integrated graphics on Strix Point is like a 1660 Ti slash 3050 slash GTX 1070 slash Vega 56. Sort of. So, for integrated graphics, think about that. A Vega 56 or a GTX 1070 as integrated graphics performance. That is still pretty decent for 1080p. With high-speed memory, that APU would be pretty good for... Integrated graphics. That's very good for integrated graphics, actually. GTX 1070 slash Vega 56 performance level. That basically means that AMD's integrated graphics is better than the mighty RX 580. Like, they've surpassed their RX 580, which is kind of like that baseline performance tier that was kind of that number that was like always above integrated graphics which means that strix point is what would that be like in terms of console that means that it's like a that means it's faster than a ps4 pro in terms of gpu performance like as integrated graphics that is that's pretty cool just think about that that doesn't does, 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 doesn't add any more power no extra power. It's just the same power TDP that the CPU uses. So for like a budget entry level, uh, pre-built or something, and you can add a GPU later, like that's actually pretty good. The funny thing too is you can still use the media and code engine in this to do things like offload video encoding. Just like you would do with Intel's QuickSync. You would do the same thing on this. And in fact, you can already do that on like any Zen 4 CPU today. Like even the ones that are not APUs, like like this. You can do the same thing with this that you can do with QuickSync. So just saying. Ryzen 8050 Strix Point Mono expected features. So monolithic design. 
up to 12 cores in hybrid config. Hybrid config. So they are going with the cloud cores. 32 megabyte of shared L3. 35% faster CPU versus Phoenix at 50 watts. 16 RDNA 3 plus compute units. 128-bit LP DDR5X memory controller. XDNA2 engine integrated. 25 TOPS AI engine. Second half 2024 launch expected. Yeah, that this will be interesting. I don't really know like when we'll actually see laptops with this. If I had to guess, the laptops that will have this are coming out early next year. So we're, we're probably not going to see anything with Strix Point APUs that are actually worth considering, like from a mobile standpoint, until next year. So this is still a ways off. Like, we're, we're most likely going to get Zen 5 on desktop before we see this stuff in laptop. So, because this will be the successor to the 78 or the 780M. 780M... Uh, actually, I think Tech Power Up has the numbers for that. Seven eighty M. Yeah, that's like a RX four seventy. So that is like a PS four Pro. Yeah, RX four seventy is a PS four Pro. So that means integrated graphics today is already equal to a PS4 Pro. The new one is going to be like a 1070 Vega 56. So yeah, that's faster than a PS4 Pro. Not as fast as a PS5 because PS5 is kind of like, it's a 6700, which is kind of like an RTX 2080, 2070 Super, somewhere in there. So yeah. Um, very, very interesting though. This is... This is that fast. Xbox One X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Series S. Yeah, it might be as fast as that. In a, in a laptop. Think about that, guys. Like, I can't stress this enough. Think about it like a laptop. A thin and light laptop. With no discrete GPU at all. Can game like an Xbox Series S. Or, or at worst... An Xbox One X. But I'm pretty sure it'll be more like a Series S. That is impressive. You couple that with like FSR 3. You can literally... I mean, t 1080p native is going to work for a lot of typical... Like League of Legends, Counter-Strike, all those like older games... Those e-sports e games, like, man, this is all you need. You don't need a fancy gaming laptop for e-sports games. Like, you just get a Strix Point laptop, and it has insane battery life, and that's all you need. Problem solved. Black Ops 3 will run 1080p once... Yeah, I know, right? Like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, yeah, that's very impressive. Every time I feel like... CPU platforms have gotten mature enough where it's like there's kind of a baseline. I'm always proven wrong. Like, they always raise the, what I consider the floor, like the baseline floor, to the next level. So, this is an example of that. It's like now, the Xbox Series S is considered like the baseline for mobile gaming. You know what I mean? So, can you imagine... Can you imagine a Steam Deck 2 with performance similar to this Strix Point APU? Or, or a, you know, like a, an Ally, an ROG, Ally 2, or whatever. You know, any of those mobile handheld things? Like, those are the sort of things that could benefit from something like this. Although, typically, like, they want custom silicon. So, some variant that performs similar to this... Probably has lower clocks or something. So, you know, I don't know. So that would be cool to see. Alright, Nintendo Switch overclocking test reveals huge memory bottleneck as overclocked RAM brings significant performance improvements. So, somebody overclocked 
The Nintendo Switch console could never keep up with the PS4 and Xbox One, but a recent overclocking test conducted with a modded console highlights exactly what was held back or what has held back the system the most. So somebody modded an OLED model with 8 gigs of RAM and what they do it has they performed an extreme overclocking test using another modded OLED 8 gig Hynix highlighting how it's most definitely the RAM Breath of the Wild manages to run close to 60 FPS by overclocking the RAM to 3, 30, 50 megahertz. Other games such as Hogwarts Legacy and The Witcher 3 show significant performance improvement with overclocked RAM, managing to run at higher than 30 FPS in most scenarios comfortably. Now, this is all good and cool, but the reason why this is not realistic... I mean, this is a cool academic thing to observe, but real-world scenario, the reason why this is not going to run like that out of the box is obviously thermal limitations and the fact that Nintendo doesn't trust the average owner of a Switch to keep it in pristine condition. So they'll probably have like dust clogging up the intake and, you know, all pet dander, whatever. So it's like, no, man. Like, the, it's cool to see this. It's very interesting to observe. Like, okay, well, that's, you know, you, you overclock the RAM and you get way better performance. But at the end of the day, it's not realistic. Power constraints as well. Yeah, but that's because it's a mobile device. Like, you, you can't really... You're you're working within those constraints. Like, it's small. It runs on battery most of the time. You know, like... But it, it's still cool to see, like, how much more performance it's capable of when it's overclocked like that. So, interesting story. I wasn't expecting to cover that one. Leaked iPhone shows an OLED and 6 gigs of RAM. 6 gigs of RAM is so 2017. Like, I don't understand how that's... Like, I don't understand. Apple is, like, super good at memory management or something because they always have such small amounts of RAM that I don't understand how they're not laggy and apps are crashing and all kinds of... Or out-of-memory errors. Like, I don't get it. I guess... I guess... Their software is just rock solid compared to Android. I, I guess. I don't know. Because every time I have to upgrade my phone on Android, I always end up having to like buy one that has you know way more RAM than whatever you get on Apple. It always gives me the impression that like if you're buying Apple, you're overpaying because you're getting less hardware for the money. But at the end of the day, obviously, it, that's not exactly how it works. So... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, here we go. Apple working on new AI-focused M4 chips for Macs, slated to launch later this year. New AI-focused M4. Everybody's coming out with their AI stuff. It'll be interesting to know if, or to see if Zen 5 on desktop contains those AI NPUs because we know mobile has it, but I don't know if desktop's gonna have it. I wouldn't be surprised if they include it though, because I kind of think that Intel's Meteor Lake on desktop or Raptor Lake, no, um, Aero Lake on desktop will probably have the AI processors built in. You notice that when iPhones print to the printer, they will sometimes just not work and need to be restarted for the print to work. Oh, the iPhone has to be restarted or the printer has to be restarted? Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know. I'm not aware of that. I've never heard that before, but that's interesting. I don't know if that has anything to do with the memory, though. The phone has to reboot. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not too familiar with iPhones. Like, I've always just used Android phones. Just because I've always felt like, for the money, you're just getting so much more hardware. And that's mostly true. 
And I typically keep my phones for a long time. Like, I don't... Let's put it this way. I upgrade my computer hardware way more often than I upgrade my phones. Like, I'll be on a phone for five, six years before I upgrade the phone. So, like, my phone refresh cycles are typically five-year intervals. My PC hardware is usually, like, two years. Like... For example, Zen 5. I'm going from Zen 4 to Zen 5. That's a two-year upgrade because Zen 4 was 2022. You never had an issue with the mid-range Android? Yeah, I just know that in the past, like in the early days of Android, they would always be memory limited. Like you would never have enough RAM. And that's why every time I would look at the equivalent iPhone, I'd always be like, how does that thing actually not run out of memory constantly you know because uh my first android phone was a uh, droid x i think that was like 512 megs of ram then my second phone was a samsung galaxy s5 which i think was two gigabytes of ram i'm pretty sure it was two maybe it was four i can't remember anymore it was either two or four then i went to a one plus five that had eight gigs of ram 8 gigs of RAM in 2017. That was a lot of RAM in a phone in 2017. Considering like a Galaxy Note 2 from Samsung only had like 6 gigs at the time. So I thought I was set with the 8 gigs of RAM in 2017. And sure enough, I didn't have to change that phone until last year. And technically, I could have kept using the phone... But I had to change it because it was too, like, there weren't enough, there was no more Android uh, security updates. You couldn't get any more, like, newer versions of Android. So at that point, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is their way of saying the phone's not supported anymore. You probably want to change. It's really old. So I went to, like, a Sony Xperia, um, Sony Xperia X1 Mark III or whatever they call it. That's what I have now. And that thing has... I think 12 gigs of memory. I mean, I can look it up. Xperia X... What is it? Sony Xperia 1... 3, I think is the name. Yeah, this thing. Yeah, this one. Th this is my current phone. Sony 1... Or Sony Xperia 1... 3? It has such a weird name. Sony Xperia 1 Mark III... So that's basically it. But it is more expensive than the iPhone 12 Pro Max. Now, the thing is with me, I I got this phone last so, last spring. Well, it was like May of last year. So it's almost been a year. I've almost had this phone for one year. I didn't buy this phone when it was new because last year, I think it was Xperia 1 5 came out. I'm pretty sure it was 5. Because this phone was new in... This was like the top dog flagship phone for Sony in 2021. I got the phone when it was already like 2 years old. So, yeah, I think Xperia 5 was the one. So, yeah. So, I didn't really spend like an insane amount of money to upgrade my phone. Because I never... I, I'm not I'm not a phone person. So, it's like, you know, I don't... I don't like to buy the phones when they're the newest thing at the full price. Like, I don't like that. So I say that as somebody who bought a 4090. Yeah, that sounds retarded to say that, but it's like, that's just how it is when it comes to phones. Sony has weird names for their cameras too. Well, I think the cameras make a little bit more sense. I don't like this, these two numbers. I feel like this is really unnecessary. They have like the one, one is the flagship because they'll also have like, for example, um, Xperia 5, 3. So they have 1 and they have 5. The 1 is the flagship. The 5 is the more mid-range budget one. I, it's, it's weird, you know? Like, nobody would know that unless they were already familiar with Sony's branding. But yeah, I typically get the phones when they've gone down in price. It was the same with the S5. It was the same with the OnePlus 5. So, I got this phone, it was already like two years old. So, I didn't really pay an insane amount of money to upgrade my phone. 
But yeah, like, um, it's one of the few phones that still has the three and a half millimeter audio jack. My phone has a three and a half millimeter audio jack. I know it's like most phones don't have that anymore. I still have that. It still has the SD card reader as well. I've got an SD card reader in mine. So it's it does the things that I that I've always been able to use on the phone. Um Phones lose value much faster than GPUs do, though. Yeah, that's because they change faster, though. That's because there's a new phone every year. That's the reason why. Like, every year there's a new phone. Every two years, there's a new GPU. Uh, and also, you have to keep in mind that phones are... There's way more phones manufactured... Then there are GPUs. GPUs are way more... Well, okay, I have to preface that statement. Because every phone has like a graphics processor inside. What I'm saying is discrete GPUs for the gaming market. There's nowhere near as many of those as there are actual phones. Like, think about that. So, so law of supply and demand. The fact that there's way more phones manufactured globally is the reason why they go down in value much faster than GPUs. Because the GPUs are like an optional thing. Like, you don't need a GPU in everyday life. Like, technically you don't. Can you really function in society without a phone at all? Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, work, school, family, etc., whatever. You know, like, can you really function without a phone? But... You could pretty easily function with a GPU. Some people might say they can't, but, you know, they're not being realistic. People actually fell for the garbage of the micro SD slowing down the performance of the phone. Yeah, that's retarded. <laughs> I've never even heard that. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, whatever. Yeah, Apple, Apple can command best prices before this AI craze because they demand so many chips. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Apple is also like TSMC's largest customer. Only reason you want A55 at the moment is for RDNA 2. A. What do you mean A55? What's A55? Is that a phone? You can function without phones if you didn't get your first cell phone until. Yeah, but, well. Y you get what I mean. Right? Like, if I... Let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. You're more likely to get into a situation where you need the phone versus you need a GPU. Let's put it that way. <laughs> like, if I... If I had to drive somewhere... Like, if I had to go somewhere that I didn't know how to go... Like, how am I going to do that? How am I going to get there? I'm going to use my phone's GPS. That's how I'm going to get there. I'm not going to look at a map. I'm not going to like re study up on how to get there, ask someone for directions. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to use my phone and that's going to be that. Like it's that easy. So that <laughs> it's like that's one example, you know? Like then another example, you go to a foreign country. What are you going to do when you're in a foreign country? You're going to need a phone. <laughs> you're literally going to need a phone. Uh there's a reason why like when I, when I went to Japan, and I was there for like half a year, I, my phone literally replaced my PC, like instantly overnight, like I brought my laptop with me, but I rarely ever used it, I ended up using my phone pretty much for everything. So I totally understand living in that type of environment in like a big urban metropolitan area. Basically, I was based out of Tokyo uh, for half a year, like living in Tokyo for half a year. I became so accustomed to using my phone for pretty much everything that I totally understand why the Nintendo Switch exists. I, I fully understand why... Mobile gaming is the biggest segment of the gaming industry. It, it 
far mobile gaming far eclipses every other like i think pc gaming and console gaming combined is still smaller than mobile gaming mobile gaming is so big and it wasn't until i lived in tokyo that i came to understand why that is the reality because i'm someone who doesn't play mobile games I don't play mobile games. Even when I was living in Japan, I didn't bother to play mobile games on my phone. But I would observe the lifestyle and how people commute for like 30 minutes, an hour, every single day, one way to their job on the train. And when you literally have like 30 minutes to an hour to commute to work or school every single day, like that gives you a bunch of time to do stuff on your phone. And that, that alone is the reason why, because most people, I would observe what they would do, and they're literally on their phone. Most people were checking social media. A lot of people were playing mobile games on their phone, like just to pass the time. So it, it is so true. You have to have a phone. Like, I don't, know, I, I don't have any idea how anybody could function in today's world without a phone. Like, no matter where you are in the world, like, if you have to travel, if you have to do anything, really, that deals with communicating with people that are not in the immediate area, you pretty much have to have a phone. Like, that's just how it is. This is true. Where would you even get a paper map anymore? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, you could ask somebody directions. But the other thing, the other thing too, is when, you, when you're in a big urban area, the roads are all, like, mishmash everywhere. It's not like a grid. Like, the thing about America... The nice thing, this, like, living in Tokyo made me really, I realized that I took for granted how American cities are designed. American roads, for those that are not based in the U.S., now, I don't know how it is in the EU or in other parts, but what I can tell you guys is in America, the roads in cities and in the rural area typically run north and south or east and west. There are few instances where roads will traverse intercardinal directions, but for most cities, the standard is your your streets and your roads go north, south, east, west. In Japan, that's not true at all. Roads go all over the place. You got you got curving, winding streets. I'm not talking about highways. I'm talking about regular roads. They go diagonal. You might have like two roads that are both going parallel diagonal. Then one crosses over the other. And you've got your east and west and they're all like mishmash. So it's like, no, it's it's a completely different, different culture, different side of the world. The zoning laws are completely different. You'll literally have businesses with apartment complexes literally stacked on top of a convenience store. You'll have people living on top of a restaurant. Like, it's not... it. Yeah. Like, trying to navigate without a phone in Tokyo is near impossible. Even for local Japanese people. If you're in the middle of a remote area, a phone becomes a paperweight when there is no cell phone service. Yeah, that's true in some areas. But in general, you're still going to have one versus not having one. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. It's like a completely different uh, reality. Yeah, okay, so my phone has 12 gigs of RAM. And it, it either has 256 or 512. I think if you have the, I think mine is 256. I'm pretty sure it's 256 of storage. And that's why I put like a one terabyte uh, micro SD card in mine. So, so I have plenty of space for filming like YouTube videos in 4K on my Sony Xperia 1. You can still download offline maps. Yeah. Well, the point is you kind of have to have a phone. You don't need to have a GPU. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and I'm saying that as somebody who did not spend full price for an Xperia 1, but did pay MSRP to Best Buy for an RTX 4090. So, 
the GPU is way more niche, way more specialized in terms of who's actually buying it. Let alone the person buying it actually even knows how to install it in the computer. You'd be surprised the number of people who buy graphics cards and don't know how to install the GPU in their PC and has to rely on a friend or pay somebody to do it. Okay, well, I think that that is that. I guess the last thing to talk about is um, try to make sure I can talk about this because I did sign an NDA. Um, hmm, let me see here. No, that didn't turn anything. Okay, what about Throne and Liberty? Throne and Liberty. So, recently, recently, for those that may or may not be aware, Throne and Liberty, it, this is an MMO. This is an upcoming MMO. And I was... I was admitted to the closed beta test. So I'm currently in the closed beta test. So I can't really talk about that. What I can tell you guys is games, for whatever reason, are becoming more increasingly hard to run and are very, very CPU heavy. I feel like the general theme of games that are coming out this year is that they are very CPU demanding. This game, the fact that it's an MMO is probably a dead giveaway, is extremely CPU heavy, so you need very heavy CPU, and I don't think this is breaking NDA, so I think what I'm about to say is not like something that I shouldn't be saying. This game Throne and Liberty, and I'm going to play more of it. I can't play this on stream, so you, unfortunately you guys cannot see the performance because I signed an NDA for the technical test that's taking place starting yesterday up until next Wednesday. Uh, this game, at 4K, native resolution, brings an RTX 4090 to its knees. An RTX 4090 when fully GPU bound in the field away from other players, gets about 44 frames per second. Anywhere from 40 to like low 60s. But the fact that it dips so heavily at 4K native tells me that we still need better rasterization performance. Because I don't think that this game and newer games are going to be easy enough to run for the 4090 in 4k native resolution so until 4k native resolution is kind of the stand like until you can do 60 fps on a i want to say like a 70 class gpu we're not there so anyone who's thinking that we've solved the rasterization problem they have no idea what they're talking about because that is not what I'm observing. So playing this game at 4K native on an RTX 4090 paired up with a 7950X 3D native res 44 to like 65 FPS. So it's kind of all over the place. It's kind of a mess. Um, and they're not going to do much more optimization. They're planning to launch sometime this year is what I've been heard. Like, if you look it up on the internet, you'll see, like, it's supposed to come out this year. So, and this is an MMO. So keep in mind, MMOs are, um, like, very niche at this point. There's not a whole lot of popular ones outside of, like, World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy. Maybe Guild Wars 2. Uh, Black Desert Online is another one that comes to mind. But Throne of Liberty is... Okay, New World's another one, but no one plays New World. Like, 
I guess I can give you guys my impressions, but I can't really say anything specific. Like, I can't talk about the story. I can't talk about the graphics and stuff. What I can say is this game is better than New World because I, I was in the closed beta and the open beta test for New World a few years ago when that game was coming out. And from what I've played... If I was forced to play one of the of either Throne of Liberty or Throne of Liberty versus New World, if I was forced to play one for one month, I would definitely play Throne of Liberty over New World. Uh, New World is easier to run. New World is an older-ish game. Uh, it's just New World's very boring to me personally. Uh, Throne of Liberty. It depends on what you like in your MMOs. I personally... Now, obviously, it's a closed beta test. It's not finalized. Um, I think that... If I had to compare Throne of Liberty to World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy... I think World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy are superior games. Like, anyone who's thinking that Throne of Liberty is the, the next WoW killer they're going to be very disappointed because that's really not the case. And I feel like I've played enough. I I guess it's okay to say this. I leveled up to level 17. I'm currently level 17 in Throne of Liberty in the beta test. And from going through the early leveling and the early areas and stuff like that and exploring randomly through the different zones, I think WoW's better. Like, I hate to say that. I hate to say that. I think WoW is a better game. Just straight up. Like, and some people might not agree with me. I think Final Fantasy is also a better game. Which is kind of disappointing. Because I was hoping that we would get some good competition from another MMO studio that would compete with the big dogs. WoW, Blizzard, and Square Enix for Final Fantasy. But from what I've played so far, I feel like I've played enough of the game to get a general impression of the overall game the combat style the exploration the questing um the the player grouping the guild system the interactions uh i i gotta say like this game and i know it's not a fair review but just from what i've played it's looking like it's a six or a seven out of ten whereas wow in its current state is more like a eight out of 10 and final fantasy in its current state is more like a nine out of 10 just to give you guys kind of my feel for how i grade these mmos so it's not a terrible game it's it's definitely a personal preference thing obviously the art style will appeal to people more or less than the people like how wow wow's art style is wow's art style is definitely very cartoony by today's standards uh, kind of like Fortnite, uh, whereas this is more like PUBG realistic style, I guess. Um, it's got a good color palette. The graphics are pretty good, I would say. They're better than New World, um, and that might be why it's harder to run. But man, I was very disappointed that my RTX 4090 could not handle this game at 4K native resolution. I found myself turning on DLSS to enjoy the game at around like 70 to 80 frames per second at 4K DLSS quality preset, which basically means 1440p. So it, it meaning if you're playing this at 1440p with a 4090, you're not going to have any problems. But if you're going to 4K, you are going to have problems if you're playing at native resolution. Now, I was playing on the highest graphic settings. I did not try to test with lower detail levels. I basically had everything maxed out, 4K native, and I was getting from like 44 to like 62, 65 FPS, depending on where I was. So you can imagine that means the range is typically in the 50s. So, um, and it wasn't a CPU bottleneck because as soon as I turn on DLSS, the problem goes away. And we're in like the mid 70s to low 80s in terms of the FPS. So I know it was GPU bound. If I go into the CPU, or if I go into the city, the game does become CPU bound, just like Dragon's Dogma 2. But surprisingly, this game 
is very well optimized for player player to player con uh i guess uh rendering so to speak because the game for those that were trying to log in to the test server yesterday the queue times were obnoxious like it was terrible like i i try to log in i was trying to create my character real quick and at least they were warning me as I was creating my character that it, it, it started showing my position in the queue. And as I was changing my character's hairstyle and stuff, it was like telling me your position in queue, 1,010, 1,057, 2,034, 3,387. I was like, oh man, I got to just like spam through the character creator and just go. I'm going to be in a queue. So I ended up getting in a queue of like 6,000 people. It was it was garbage you know so they got to fix their login queues obviously they're not running enough test servers to fix the login queues so that's not a thing i'm going to really ding them on uh, I, I assure i'm pretty sure that they're going to fix that before launch but overall the game is relatively fun if you like mmos i think there's a lot in there that you're going to get out of it there is pvp there is uh, oh, it's opt-in pvp so it's not like you're going to get ganked while you're trying to quest um, although they do have zones, supposedly they're going to have like servers with zones that are contested zones, just like on a PvP server in WoW Classic. So if you like that kind of stuff, uh, you're probably going to like this game. Uh, I know New World is pretty big on PvP, at least World PvP. So um, I didn't get to experience any of that because the server was set up in a way where you couldn't really do that. And everyone's low level anyway, so there's no point. Um, but yeah, it's... I think it's a pretty decent MMO. I personally don't know if I will play it at its official launch. Um, that remains to be seen. I'll play a little bit more of it off stream, obviously, and maybe uh, revisit a more comprehensive overview of my thoughts once I get to a higher level. Uh, but it's an okay game. I, I would say overall, my general feeling is like it's like a 6 or 7 out of 10, which isn't terrible. I would say anything that's like a five or lower is a fail as far as I'm concerned. So this is kind of like fair, you know, if it's seven out of 10, it's, it's playable. It's not terrible. Um, the performance is one thing though. Like you got to have a high end PC. So it's like the same deal with dragon's dogma. You got to have like an insane monster CPU, um, probably X3D. X3D is fine. Like I couldn't tell any problems with CPU, but that's because I was using an X3D. So obviously, you know, that's going to solve the problems with uh, player characters in the city. Now, having said that, the lowest FPS that I observed in the city when there was literally hundreds of other players running around in the city was about 42 FPS. That's actually pretty good considering the server was jam-packed full of players. People were like lining up in the thousands to log in and... It was playable in the city with literally player characters, like literally in my face as far as the eye could see. So they've done a pretty good job in terms of optimiz optimization for the player characters being rendered um, in your viewport. Um, but the game is still extremely GPU heavy uh, as far as I'm concerned. So those are my thoughts on Thorn Liberty. I think it's going to be an interesting game but i don't think it's going to it's not going to dethrone wow it's not going to dethrone final fantasy it's coming out in a time where it's not really ideal for this game i feel like if this game came out last year or maybe next year i think it will probably be more popular mainly because we are getting a final fantasy expansion this summer and which I know a ton of MMO people, myself included, are going to resub to the game and we're going to play the game. So we're not going to be playing Throne of Liberty. And the other game that's getting an expansion is WoW. World of Warcraft is getting an expansion later this year, probably in the fall. So I think if this game comes out, the best time to come out this year for this game would be August. I want to say like August, September would be the window of opportunity for Throne of Liberty to launch and ha and be relatively successful in terms of a player count. 
Um, so we'll see. It's very hard to run though, guys. So unless you have a beefy computer, I don't know what to say. I mean, Final Fantasy runs on pretty much everything these days, and WoW runs on a potato. So this game's got some steep competition from the the tried and true juggernauts of the MMO industry, as far as I'm concerned. So we'll see what Ashes of Creation does whenever that comes out. And I think Riot Games is supposed to be making an MMO as well. Although that's I don't expect to hear anything about that until like two, three years from now. So anyway, guys, that's gonna do it for this stream. Uh it was an interesting one. Not a lot of new tech related stuff, but uh it is what it is. I will I don't know if I'm gonna do a live stream this weekend. I don't know. Maybe Dragon's Dogma. Maybe finish up Dragon's Dogma on stream or Final Fantasy VII. Either one of those. Uh, we'll see. So that's going to be it for this week in tech, episode 55. If you are new to the channel, do hit that subscribe button. If you like this sort of long form discussion content so you know when I'm live. Because I don't just go live Thursdays, but Thursdays we do do this weekly show. So you can look forward to this if you like that. And then... As always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Take care. I'll see you next week. Thanks.